there's certainly a lot of moving pieces in the economic outlook. We have seen a lot of froth come out of the market. I think the market is more trying to find a level. These numbers obviously are too hot. The Federal Reserve has not been forceful enough in stating not just what their goal is, 2% inflation, but the means to achieve that goal. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. This price action is absolutely brutal. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance live on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Abramovitz and Kelly Lyons, I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK taking the day off to watch the North London Derby. We'll talk about that later. Down three quarters of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, down more than 1%. The carnage out there, Lisa, it gets worse. We've been saying, when we get capitulation, are we starting to get a bit of it, given the fact that this is a growth concern more than just a rate concern? And you're seeing this because as you get carnage, a little bit of a haven trade in more of the traditional places, including treasuries, a unique moment after so much rate fear. Yields down for a fourth straight session. Yeah. I was talking about the carnage in the last 24 hours. If you've seen the performance in some of the biggest names in this equity market, Netflix year to date down 72%, Facebook down 44, Amazon down 37, Tesla down 30, Microsoft down 22, 23%, Google down 21, call it 22, Apple down by 18%, and Lisa in the pre market for some of those names, it gets worse, not better. I saw when you put that out on Twitter, I thought it was fascinating because of the size and scope. Most ever most since 2008. Is this 2008? It really hasn't felt quite like that, but perhaps 2000, 2002, when you get certain names that fall out of bed completely and there's a repricing within specific parts of the market. We have not seen a wholesale financial market collapse as of yet. The question is, are the risks starting to build slowly as you start to get a bit more of a mass exodus? Kelly, a theme for us to build on through the morning is just the wealth destruction we're seeing through those names, through this equity market and something you've been covering for the last couple of days through crypto too. Yeah, through crypto too. I mean, I could go all day on stable coins. But the fact of the matter is a lot of the people invested in cryptocurrencies, John, are mom and pop. They're retail traders, people that have been putting money into this market since the bottom of the pandemic and are now really feeling that pain. Just when you look at the major averages, more than $6 trillion worth of market value has been wiped out just since the end of March. If you bought into the NASDAQ 100 at any point in 2021, you have now lost money. And at some point for the American consumer, that's going to matter. You put it all together, just the nature of this move in this market cross asset lisa it has all the traits right now of a growth scare it's changed somewhat from an inflation scare to a rate scare to a growth scare and i think the bond market is speaking to that through the last week and i think that that really is the takeaway we have reached that pivot point where people have baked in a fed tightening cycle that will be robust and then they're getting to the other side of it and they're saying what's next what's going to save this market at a time when the global economy is slowing and frankly these price pressures are not going to abate whether it's oil prices whether it's gas in europe or whether it's the china lockdowns thursday morning good morning here is your price Action. We are negative three quarters of 1% on the S&P on the NASDAQ 100 down again by more than 1%, negative 1.1%. In the FX market, the euro breaking down. We'll talk about that one later. That currency pair, negative 8 tenths of 1%. Euro dollar just about holding on to 104, 104.30 there. And in the bond market, this is it, isn't it, Lisa? Bramo, we're down 10, 11 basis points on a 10-year, 281.55. You remember we were up at 320 and people were saying we're going to get to 350. Could we get to 4% on a 10-year yield in the near term? Now we've gone way back down. People are saying we saw peak yields. This is is very much, as you were saying, as we've been talking about all week, a growth scare coming to the fore and rate scare moving to the back. 8.30 a.m., we get the latest read on U.S. economic data. U.S. April, a PPI, producer price uh, inflation. How much does that also surprise to the upside after yesterday's CPI? The initial jobless claims we also get at 8.30, and I want to see what the trend is, given the fact that we've seen the U.S. unemployment rate fall to near the lowest levels going back in history and certainly pre-pandemic at a time when people are saying that that unemployment rate has to rise in order to reduce some of the froth in the labor market. Do we see signs of that? Do we see it moving in the other direction? And does that give us some sort of sense that perhaps the Fed is even that much further behind the curve? At 12 noon, we get the USDA Agricultural Supply and Demand Report. Normally, we wouldn't be talking about this, but it's actually one of the most important things we're going to be talking about because food price inflation has risen to a record high, according to a UN index. And we want to see how much of a shortage there is in corn 
in wheat, in soybeans, so that we can figure out how much more this has to go and what potentially could be some of the frictions and fissures that result. And at 1 p.m., we get a Treasury auction, $22 billion of 30-year notes. How much do we see an ongoing flight to safety in debt that had been left for dead over the past uh, a few months, given the fact that people are worried about longer-term growth and worried, John, about the consequences of some sort of downturn in the near term and then a reversion to an even lower trend of inflation and growth after that. Yields down again today. Lisa, thank you for that. Just looking at things, Kaylee, 285, the higher two-year last week. We're back to 257. We're down seven basis points. A 10-year, the higher the week, 320. We're back down to 282. We're down nine basis points. These moves, Kaylee, are more than notable. Yeah, they've been remarkable. And what's interesting is really what has driven them as well. We've seen break evens coming in substantially. So inflation expectations are coming lower. And this really just reinforces this is no longer about the Fed reining in inflation. It is about what happens as a result of that. To get inflation under control, do you ultimately have to cause a U.S. recession? And that is what a flattening yield curve is signaling to some extent, John. Two tens, 26 basis points, down about four basis points on the day. Mark Howard joins us now, senior multi-asset specialist at BNP Paribas. About. Mark, a lot of people have lost a lot of money. Confidence is absolutely battered. What do you tell those people today? Just like you did, Jonathan, I say it's been brutal and it's likely to remain brutal for a while when you look at the cross market activity of late uh, and the, the migration of uh, these worries from, you know, the rate market, the currency market into the equity market, back to the rate market. And now it's creeping into credit. And um, as, as Lisa knows all so well, uh, when you start to see a give up in the credit market, that's when you worry about the real economy. And then add to that what we got yesterday, which was um, a, a broadening of the inflation concern out of the producer sector into the service sector. It means that the consumer is going to feel this longer uh, as, the, as, the, as the year plays out. And, and the important narrative there is that if the Fed's not going to come and save the day, the consumer has to. And it looks like the consumer is not going to be as robust as many had hoped for. Mark, this so th I tell people you got to you got to, you know, steal up for some rough months ahead. Mark, this market is moving incredibly quickly. And a lot of people said that speed matters. At what point does the pace of this market start to scare you, start to worry uh, people about some sort of financial market breakdown? Mm. Well, uh, it, it worries us when you start to see financial intermediaries have uh, measurable problems. We haven't seen that as yet. Uh, but but like Kaylee was just saying, we're watching the crypto space really closely because, you know, we don't think this crypto winter is like the last couple of crypto winters. Uh, you know, there are more players in the market, more sophisticated players in the market. And while, sure, many of the people have been hurt have been uh, you know, smaller mom and pops. There are also a lot more sophisticated players in there today than there were two or four years ago. And they can move markets aggressively and not just in crypto, but in their hedges against crypto. And I think that's some of the price action we've seen recently, uh, both in equities and in rates. Don't, don't just look at the currency markets when you think about what people are doing in crypto. You got to look at the rates market. And I think some of the, uh, the safe haven trade you've seen may also be some offset hedging from uh, from crypto. So crypto stories usually are somewhat out of the mainstream of the financial markets. They're their own asset class. At this moment, we are seeing more than $200 billion wiped off of the cryptocurrency market in a day, according to some estimates. But Aaron Brown, a Bloomberg Opinion columnist, raised another question saying that this is actually a bigger concern for the broader financial markets because this raises an issue of what fissures happen when you have money market funds trying to sell treasuries as liquidity that have lost so much value and then fail to come up with the same amount uh, that they have promised their investors. Are you starting to see concerns on that level, on some sort of systemic level? Um, we have not, but I think Aaron is, is right to flag that as something to monitor. Um, we, we have not seen that specifically in our flows or in some of the things that we look at uh, in the internals. But yes, there, there are concerns about uh, market structure within Treasuries, for example, that's been flagged by regulators and, and others. Uh, but there's a lot of focus on that. I think I, I worry a little bit slightly differently, which is the seepage of uh, of the, the worries in the broader blockchain architecture and the repricing of those platforms flows into the into the whole venture capital ecosystem mm. in a way that we haven't seen before because there wasn't nearly as much invested uh, in in DeFi 
uh, a year, two years, three years ago. So there's a lot more exposure. That's where the SoftBank news today is particularly noteworthy because yeah. they're one of the biggest investors in this rapid growth space. Uh, Bitcoin is a corner of that, but there's other sectors, uh, the broader blockchain ecosystem, and even biotech, which have taken a terrible, terrible pounding. And so this broader growth, uh, growth sector, which has been hiring a lot of people, uh, not just the Pelotons of the world, but a whole host of them, those those employers are going to start to reverse. We're already seeing it, right? Uh, and that's going to affect the real economy in, in ways later this year. Yeah, that record loss for the SoftBank Vision Fund, certainly remarkable, Mark. As we talk about the pain across asset classes, what would you be looking for as a signal of a meaningful bottom, potentially an entry point? Well, how about three more rate hikes from the Fed at 50 <laughs> basis points? Uh you know, I think, how about just starting QT? One of Jonathan's favorite uh, narratives going back a couple months ago. We haven't really kicked in on that. So we want to see more of the the removal of accommodation. Uh, we, you know, there's going to be a lot of price. They're going to be some dead cat bounces. They're going to be some uh, relief rallies, but that's not going to give me any solace. We, we need to see the Fed get serious about withdrawing accommodation and, and then we need to see further repricing in the credit market. As Lisa said a couple of days ago, we've seen triple C's start to gap up, you know, what we call decompression within the credit space. Uh, and, and we need to see more of that, not just in high yield, but also in the investment grade market. Um, that to me is gonna be a sign that you've, you've gotten closer to a turn, but we haven't really gone very far there yet. Hey, Mark is starting though, it's starting. Mark Howard there mm -hmm. of BNP Paribas. Mark, great to catch up, buddy. Consensus now. 50 at the next meeting, 50 after that. Wells Fargo just published, Lisa. In order to tamp down inflation, we now believe the Fed will raise the effective federal funds rate at a slightly more aggressive pace this year. Look for 50 in June, 50 in July, and 50 again in September. Honestly, yesterday's CPI print gave nothing for anyone to feel comfortable about because we did not see the degree of deceleration that many people had hoped for. Things have been extremely uncomfortable for a lot of people. Futures down six tenths of one percent on the S&P. With Lisa Bramitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Happy to stay in the seat. Kaylee Lines, TK back with us tomorrow. From New York, this is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Laura Wright. Cryptocurrencies resumed their declines today. The collapse of the Terra USD stablecoin triggered a flight from many popular digital tokens. Bitcoin fell below $26,000 before rebounding. Backers of Terra USD are trying to raise $1.5 billion to shore up the token. The British economy unexpectedly contracted in March. Gross domestic product fell one tenth of a percent from February as the cost of living squeeze forced consumers to cut back their spending. That's throwing doubt on the Bank of England's ability to keep raising interest rates and it's putting pressure on Prime Minister Boris Johnson's government to respond. Policymakers at the Federal Reserve face pressure for more aggressive action after a hotter than expected inflation report. So far, though, officials are sticking with their strategy to raise interest rates by half a percentage point at each of their next two meetings. St. Louis Fed President James Bullard told Yahoo Finance that the half point moves are a good benchmark for now. Senate Democrats were blocked in an attempt to enshrine abortion rights in federal law. All Republicans and one Democrat, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, voted to keep a bill ensuring nationwide access to abortions from reaching the Senate floor. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said he wanted to put Republicans on record just as the Supreme Court is poised to overturn the landmark Roe v. Wade decision. Global News 24 hours a day on air and a Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg. season is here. A very good quarter against an incredibly choppy backdrop. The uncertainty is palpable. We are cautiously optimistic. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. JP Morgan spot on. Delta flying. Heat on fixed income trading on equities trading. With exclusive expert analysis. It's a stunning statistic. Bank earnings not resonating with investors. What's the disconnect here? Are they bracing for the worst? Can the market still go higher? Bloomberg television and radio. The fastest numbers and analysis you trust. Right now, America is fighting on two fronts. 
At home, it's inflation and rising prices. Abroad, it's helping Ukrainians defend their democracy and feeding those who are left hungry around the world because Russian atrocities exist. Putin's war has, has, has cut off critical sources of food. The President of the United States speaking a few times this week already on inflation. From New York City this morning, good morning. Futures negative once again on the S&P, on the Nasdaq too. We're down three quarters of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we're down by more than 1%. Yields are lower by nine basis points. Call it 10, 282.45. Some of this reflecting a growth scare that's gripping this market with commodities lower. Copper, sub 9K. Crude, 104, just about 103.99, with negative 1.62%. The president, Lisa, yesterday, in a statement following that inflation print, mentioned the Fed. These were the words. They'd always acknowledge the independence of the Federal Reserve, and then it's an and but. Yeah. And here it is. I believe we've built a strong economy and a strong labor market, and I agree with Chairman Powell with what he said last week, that the number one threat to that strength is inflation. I'm confident the Fed will do its job with that in mind. What do you make of that? Basically, he's giving the go-ahead for them to raise rates and to tighten as much as possible, but he's also shifting the blame. This is a complete punt to basically say it's their job to rein in inflation. It, they're going to have basically the spotlight on them and look to them for a reason why it's not going down if it doesn't. Did this feel like the blame tour for you? <laughs> over the last couple of days. Honestly, blame Putin, blame the Fed, blame geopolitical issues, blame the lockdowns in China, blame whoever, but it's not necessarily going to be an introspective look at how we got here in terms of some of the policies. There's a big debate around how much uh, the uh, the stimulus checks really added to this. That will continue to be a debate. It's strange to me that they're not trying to get ahead of it and frankly addressing it head on and doing even studies on it. Let's have that conversation right now with Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Weisenhaus, Germany and Jack Fitzpatrick down in D.C. Jack, first to you, sir. What's the plan? He's talked a lot about it over the last couple of days. Lay it out for us. Uh, on inflation, it, you're, you guys are right to note that the president is uh, is looking to the Fed a lot. That serves as a sort of it, it's somebody else's job line. Uh, there are uh, it's, it's, a, it's a scattershot plan aside from that. They'll talk about uh, a, a bill that would I increase taxes in the way the Democrats have talked about. That, that would be a much longer term issue, uh, obviously, as it relates to inflation. They'll talk talk about uh, meat processing companies and, and gas prices and other things that they can do here or there. Uh, but the legislative outlook is very limited on what the president can do. And so you're going to continue to hear him uh, talk about a, a scattershot approach on his own end, but very frequently looking to the Fed uh, to really hit at the, the crux of the inflation issue. Jack, we talk about President Biden, his view on inflation, how he's coming out and portraying this. Is this really just him? How much dissent is there within his administration about how the president should be approaching this both in, in, in rhetoric as well as in action? In actions, it, it, the, there's not enough dissent. There's there's not that much dissent because their options are very limited. There is a, a push now and then from Democratic lawmakers who want a gas rebate. There was the discussion about a gas tax holiday. Uh, again, they're very limited there because they can't just snap their fingers and do something without Republican support. Um, in terms of rhetoric, the president has talked about trying to get out on the campaign trail more naturally he will do that as we get closer to the midterms um, but there's there's a bit of a sense among Democrats broadly that their hands are tied to a very significant extent because they're waiting to see exactly what happens in Ukraine uh, they're hoping that we can have more of a, a global economic reopening and move past the pandemic uh, but they there is an understanding that a significant amount of this is out of the president's hands in the short term well on that subject of the war in Ukraine and the resulting embargo on Russian fossil fuels that the U.S. has put into place. Maria, the headline out of the IEA today, Russian oil revenues are up 50 percent even despite that because, of course, there's still buyers out there and Europe hasn't put an embargo in place yet. How much is the focus on energy at the G7 meeting where you are in Germany today? 
yeah, this G7 meeting that is going to start here in Weisenhaus in about uh, two hours time. Of course, the energy conversation is always present in Europe. When you look at gas, I mean, forget about it. This is not even going to feature uh, majorly in this discussion. When you look at the oil embargo, well, at this point, it's almost an embarrassment uh, for the European Union. There was a G7 communique that came out days ago on Sunday, and the Europeans were still working on their plan that they announced a week ago, and we still don't have a deal uh, on it. Now, the other big focus, of course, will be that relationship uh, with Ukraine. And I should note, Kaylee, that Dmitry Kuleba, who is the uh, Ukrainian foreign minister, will be here today participating in this G7 meeting. The Moldovan also foreign minister will be attending the meeting, and a lot of this will focus on the financial needs for Ukraine. Remember, the country says they need on a monthly basis now, and this is hard cash, five to seven uh, billion dollars. That's to pay basic expenses. The other big conversation will be about NATO and the EU. The Ukrainians have had a major reality check. NATO is not going to happen for them. But how about the European Union? If you're ever going to be a broadcast correspondent in life, <laughs> be the European correspondent. The European tour, Bramo, continues it's, for Maria. It's basically the European tour of vacation spots. Maria, are you enjoying your time on the beach there? <laughs> well, I, I, I would say yeah, but the fact that uh, the weather here changes by the hour, the food in Germany is oh, a yeah. little bit... Mm -hmm. There we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Nice I feel team. for you. They're Lives all in Germans, Brussels, so they but hate she's me still right Spanish. Now. They're all Germans. They hate me right now. <laughs> Maria, it's great to catch Hans up. my cameraman. He's not happy about this at all. <laughs> Maria Tadeo, awesome as always. Jack Fitzpatrick there down at D.C. Isn't that true? You can take her out of Spain, but you can't take the Spain out of her. <laughs> The That's the story. Bad. I mean, the food is... Eh. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> Javier Blas, he wrote to me this morning and he talked about the refining issues. This is really, really important stuff now. So a lot of people waking up, seeing the price of gas, the price of diesel, looking at the SPR release from this administration, trying to boost output. As Javier has pointed out repeatedly, Lisa, you have to convert the crude into something. And to do that, it's all about the refiners. And he's really concerned about refining capacity and really concerned about prices and availability. He was talking about the IEA monthly market report, and he said he has never heard language like what they were using in terms of the shortage of refined goods. And we are seeing that in the prices of some of those refined goods and how much they're divorcing themselves from the underlying price of oil. How much is that going to really be the driver, particularly because that's what consumers feel, right? I mean, we don't feel the spot market. In a massive way, Lisa nailed it. Down three quarters of 1% on the S&P and the Nasdaq 100, down by 1.1. Yields lower by nine basis points on a 10-year 282.99. The volatility, I think it's fair to say, continues. Heard on radio, seen on TV, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. from New York City this morning. Good morning on TV and radio. We pull back once again on the S&P down about a half of 1% on the Nasdaq down eight tenths of 1%. Year to date, the S&P down 17 percentage points. The Nasdaq 100 down 27. It has been that bad beneath the surface. There are some even bigger losers, which used to have a monster market cap. And now let's just say it less so. In the bond market, things are changing up. We need to talk about it. This is looking more and more like a growth scare. Four straight days yields lower, down another nine basis points on a 10-year, 282.99. The high this week, 320. We breached that level intraday. We came all the way back. On a two-year, the high last week, 285. We got to that level. We come all the way back, down another five basis points to 258.39. Are we questioning how far the Fed can take this? Let's take a look at foreign exchange. The story used to be in FX, an aggressive Federal Reserve, a BOJ that would do nothing. Dolly Yen to the move. Dolly Yen's coming back now. It's different. 128.75. We're down nine tenths of 1% on that currency pair. And I would say, Lisa, this is more representative of that classic risk aversion move. Yen strength yields lower. It's all starting to build in a different way compared to where we were maybe a number of months ago. We're getting more of a traditional growth scare. How this actually shakes out remains to be seen. But you are seeing that in some of the more traditional currencies. However, how long can this last? I really do wonder if this is just a breather or if this is something more substantial. Because what you are seeing right now is uh, Treasury yields going in, are we seeing buyers start to come in from Japan, or is this just basically
basically a fluke, people uh, pushing out their shorts to get ahead of whatever comes next. The dollar index right now, the strongest since 2002. The euro just seems to be in a lose-lose position at the moment. Everything going the wrong way for it. Euro dollar 104.33. We're negative three quarters of one percent. There's a meeting for the ECB in just a couple of weeks' time, Lisa. I think it's June 9th. That is a tough spot for this ECB to be in. They hike, people talk about a recession. They don't hike, they talk about inflation getting out of control and the euro heading even further south. It seems to me that if they don't hike, it's euro negative. If they hike, it's euro negative. And that seems to be the consensus position on the street right now, which, Lisa, is why a lot of people don't want to buy it. I was just going to say exactly that. There was a story yesterday out in Bloomberg talking about how the consensus right now is to get to zero and beyond, to get to positive base rates in Europe by the end of the year. That should be a euro positive if you believe in the transmission mechanism of strengthening the currency, but that really leads to a weaker economy. Right now, that's not the feeling. Euro dollar Lisa 104.31. All of this, are we there yet? I think that that's basically the sentiment right now. Are we at the end of capitulation or the beginning of capitulation that will lead to a buying opportunity or at least some washout that can give some stability? Joanne Feeney has been tracking this. She's portfolio manager uh, and partner in Advisors Capital Management, longtime advisor to the likes of the Federal Reserve, uh, the IMF, the World Bank. Joanne, you are looking at this scenario. Are we there yet in terms of capitulation? Well, great question, and good morning, Lisa, John. Uh, you know, clearly the market is on edge. Uh, there are a lot of real risks out there uh, that have people very cautious. It started out with r rising interest rates way back in November, that concern. But now it's really shifted to more concern about real economic activity risk. And obviously the, the data out of the United Kingdom this morning with their decline in GDP has people more concerned that we could see a broader global economic slowdown. So I, I think valuations have come in quite a lot. Uh, and, and that, I think, will help people start to look for opportunities where they can be repositioned for a longer-term appreciation. It may still be rocky for a while, but, boy, some of those valuations have gotten very attractive. Joanne Finney there of Advisors Capital Management. Here's the good news. I'm told that you could hear that. Here's the bad news. <laughs> I couldn't. So it's hard to respond in an interview when I can't hear Joanne and what she's got to say. Joanne, we're going to try and reestablish that, and we'll come back to you. But I'm pleased to say at least that our audience heard the answer to Lisa's question. So I'm told. <laughs> well, yeah, you can write I'm in. Gonna, tell us what the most important points are, I'm and we can follow trust, up the I'm conversation. I'm going to trust the control room <laughs> right now on that. They're going to tell me once that's reestablished. Lisa, as we reset, we did this about 30 minutes ago. We're talking about real wealth destruction now. Now it depends on your time horizon. If you go back over the last couple of years, there's a lot of people still in the green and the money. But this is feeling really, really bad right now. You're going to look at your statements. You're going to see. The losses in the equity market, the losses in crypto, you're going to look at your bills, utilities, just to go through the numbers in CPI yesterday, utilities were up 13.7% from a year ago. That's the most since 2008. Shelter costs, month on month, for a third straight month, up 0.5%. The most since 2005. Lisa, these are real issues. And when people start talking about a cost of living crisis, I don't think that's a stretch. That's not being too dramatic. That's what it feels like right now for a lot of people. Right, and you're seeing that uh, also borne out in equity markets in specific pockets. You talk about the re-rating of risk within the equity markets. Jonathan Gallup of Credit Suisse put out a really interesting report talking about how much valuations and what's expensive and what's cheap ends up coming out. And basically, what's been expensive is still somewhat expensive in terms of big uh, stocks, but you are seeing within the tech space some carnage. It's just shocking to me that people are not swooping in and buying the behemoths that were thought of as the safe trade just a month ago. I, I, what what point do they become safe again? The problem for the politicians as well, the ones in control, real wages down for a 13th straight month in April. That is a problem for this White House. Joanne Feeney of Advisors Capital Management. Joanne, I'm told that you can hear us and I'm told that I might be able to hear you. So let's take a shot at this. Joanne, the wealth destruction, the tightening of financial conditions, the markets are always trying to anticipate things. Sometimes they're wrong, sometimes they're right. When do you expect to see the damage done in this market start to translate into damage into the economic data? You know, John, it's almost like all data is bad data these days, uh, whether it's uh, a good sign like inflation slowing down, uh, whether it's a good sign like imports being very high, which is a strong signal of consumer demand. But the market is simply on edge, and uh, they are clearly running to safety, as we're seeing in some of those stock moves that you guys described. But investors, I'm finding, are taking a different view depending on how they're positioned. You know, we're hosting our annual meeting this week, 
uh, down in Hoboken, and we have uh, you know over 100 of our advisor uh, partners here. Talking to them last night at the reception, now maybe alcohol helped, but they weren't as worried as I really was expecting them to be. And maybe it's because that some of our leading strategies for them are income-oriented, high dividends, bigger, stable companies with really strong balance sheets, and, and it makes them comfortable and able to ride out this volatility in the market. And that's not going to be true for all investors. Growth investors fully are suffering. They're going to have to wait longer, I think. Well, talking about some of those specific companies, Joanne, I noticed Amazon is on your list here that you sent in. That is a stock down 37% year to date. It is trading at levels we last saw. And I believe April 2020, almost like the pandemic didn't even happen. What do you make of that price action and are investors getting something wrong? Yeah, I do think that one's overdone, and I think several of them are overdone. People really responded badly to the retail slowdown that Amazon was seeing, and clearly that was going to be the case after the pandemic. You know, really pretty much a lot of it's behind us in terms of spending patterns. But what people are overlooking with Amazon is their cloud business. Amazon Web Services is, you know, the biggest uh, and going to be the biggest profit generator for many years to come with, you know, over 35% growth for many years to come. So I think, you know, that's one where we didn't buy it until quite recently because, it, you know, valuation was too high. Uh, and we think that's going to be a place that investors will increasingly turn to, to ride out, perhaps if we get a stronger slowdown in growth, perhaps if we get a recession. The companies exposed to cloud are going to see their demand continue to grow over multiple years. Investors are going to want to be there to build in some recovery, particularly over the long term in their portfolios. In what other areas have valuations come in enough that it's safe to buy at this point? Well, Amazon, you know, is sort of like a tech consumer discretionary company. But if you look in Infotech, for example, you know, companies like Broadcom, stalwarts in cloud computing and software as well. Um, companies like Qualcomm have come down a lot. They not only provide chips for smartphones, but they also are increasingly providing chips to automobiles, to industrials. Connectivity is spreading. That's another long-term trend that's only going to grow over time. And they're a company that sells not just the chips, but also the intellectual property on which they make, obviously, very, very high margins. So th that's a couple of other companies that we think have really traded off far too much. Good place to go if we do end, end up in a cyclical recession. You want to own companies that have secular growth drivers over the long term. Joanne, awesome to catch up. And my apologies about the technical issue. The good news is that everyone else could hear you. <laughs> Joanne Feeney there of Advisors Capital Management. Mohamed al Arian out on Twitter just moments ago. We'll catch up with him tomorrow on Bloomberg TV. This is what he had to say, Lisa. Growth concerns are compounding the unsettling effects of inflation and liquidity worries. The continued large wealth destruction is starting to trigger spreading market functioning worries as those keep an eye on the volatile and gapping U.S. government bond market. That's kind of been the story, hasn't it? over the last few months. So now we flip to where is the Fed put? And I ask this because Jim Bullard even raised this issue yesterday of uh, the St. Louis Fed where he basically said he is concerned about financial stability and financial market conditions and he's watching that as they all are. At what point do they care enough to actually back away from some of their rate hiking plans before it even starts? I mean, if we price in the ramifications, do they come in and actually make good on them or do they back away? So Katie, the Fed put is not dead. It's firmly in retirement. What brings it back out of retirement? I think it's a really good question considering what happens if you see further deterioration, further wealth destruction at the same time that inflation is not coming down potentially at a quick enough pace. Because, yes, maybe the peak already is in. Now it's about that downward slope and the eventual plateau and how long it takes to get there. If inflation is still at a five handle at the end of this year, is the Fed going to be comfortable tapping the brake pedal once again, or does it still going to feel like it needs to accelerate the tightening of policy? How do they balance those two things if they're happening simultaneously? The unknowns, one of them, and you touch on it, Kaylee, how much inflation will they tolerate at year end if growth is decelerating in the way that some people in this market anticipate? Lisa, the other issue as well, and Priya Misra has made this point several times over at TD, is that we're already going to see some damage, not based on what they've done, because the Fed hasn't done much. QT hasn't started. We've seen 75 basis points of hikes. It's about what the markets anticipate. Financial conditions have already tightened. You've got mortgage rates through 5%. And as Priya said, no one's borrowing at Fed funds rate. <laughs> the long bond has already sold off. You're at to three. Mortgage prices, you've seen the cost of mortgages now, Lisa. And Priya's point really is that A, she doesn't think the economy is as resilient as, say, Chairman Powell believes and others think. And B, that we're already seeing the tightening. 
but we're not seeing it translate into the economy just yet. And we saw that with the inflation print yesterday, which raises a conundrum. If the transmission mechanism is markets and the tightening has not been enough, do they need to go harder? We'll continue to explore that conundrum in just a moment. Equity futures down seven tenths of one percent on the S&P from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word news, I'm Laura Wright. In North Korea, Kim Jong-un has ordered all cities to be put under lockdown after the country reported its first COVID case. In the past, North Korea has always denied it had any cases, a claim that's been doubted by outside experts. The country also has refused vaccines from the outside world. Russia's oil revenues are up 50% this year, despite trade restrictions following the invasion of Ukraine. According to the International Energy Agency, Russia earned roughly $20 billion each month this year from combined sales of crude and products. Still, the IEA says that new sanctions could change that. The Pentagon is negotiating to buy a tank-busting drone that would be sent to Ukraine. Californian-based Aerovironment makes the Switchblade 600, which can fly more than 24 miles and linger over a target for more than 40 minutes. The Pentagon has already committed to send at least 700 smaller, shorter-range Switchblades to Ukraine. The Senate has added a third nominee of President Biden to the Federal Reserve Board. Lawmakers confirmed economist Philip Jefferson as a Fed governor. The vote was 91 to 7. Today, Senate Democrats say they expect to vote confirming Jerome Powell for a second term as Fed chair. Bloomberg has learned that HSBC has begun an internal analysis to help rebuff a proposal to split off its Asian operations. That proposal comes from the bank's largest shareholder, Ping An Insurance, which wants to improve returns. About 65% of HSBC's pre-tax profits last year came from Asia. The bank argues that much of that is actually business with Western clients. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 100 and 20 countries. This is Bloomberg. People still are confident the Federal Reserve is going to do its job. But if you keep under promising, you know, what you're going to, you know, what, what's required, uh, then I think there is a risk to the Fed's credibility down the road. Dudley, Bill Dudley there, the Bloomberg opinion columnist and senior advisor to Bloomberg. Economics, equity futures right now, down seven tenths of one percent on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100, down a little more than one full percentage point. Yields in, let's call it nine basis points, Lisa, 283.35. But that's the trend, Lisa, over the last four days. Growth scare, where do you find the havens? And the dollar, I think, also, in addition to yields going lower, the dollar continuing to strengthen, which is all tightening for the Fed in ways that is problematic for the global uh, economy, perhaps, perhaps a bit more than the U.S. economy. The cost of living crisis as well. Kaylee, the cost of renting mm -hmm. at the moment. I don't want to make it too New York-centric. I just saw the data on Manhattan this morning. It gets worse. It does not get better. It's gotten worse for three months. Three months of record rent prices in Manhattan. I myself am officially priced out. I am moving to Brooklyn next month because I basically had no other choice. But it really speaks to a shelter inflation problem in the U.S. And when you have rents going up and mortgage rates going up as well, which in theory is a problem for people who want to buy, what do you do? Bramo, these numbers up 6.2% from the previous record set in March, up 39% from April 2021. This isn't a supply chain issue. I just want to point that out. And this is important because it was a big component of the CPI print yesterday. It was the biggest increase in rent inflation going back to 2006, the biggest increase in airline prices ever. It was up some 18 percent month over month for airplane tickets. How much is that going to be what concerns the Fed? Because this is going to have a stickier feel to it, John. And that's the problem for this Fed as we go through this year. Greg Dacker joins us now, chief economist at EY Parthian. Let's start here, Greg, where you see inflation year end. The Fed sees it something close to four. Where do you see it at? I expect inflation to be uh, in the 4% when you're looking at the PCE gauge. Uh, but I think on a CPI basis, we're likely to still have a 5% handle uh, on CPI and core CPI. Um, both are going to be sticky in the current environment. Um, as you highlighted, we have some categories of uh, spending that are going up in prices. Housing is a key component where we're seeing home price inflation feeding through to the CPI index. It's both rent and the cost of owning a home that are going up. 
probably going to move past 5% on a year-over-year -year basis. You have healthcare costs rising. You have the likes of food still being quite strong. And you have leisure and hospitality prices also rising as there is still robust demand. And that's likely to last through the summer. So still some upward pressures there in terms of inflation, even though we may be past that significant peak in inflation. Is the Fed having any effect on that inflationary pressure based on how it's jawboned markets into a tighter financial condition? Uh, Lisa, I think there are really three factors that are going to drive inflation lower. I mean, first is that they're going, there's going to be cooler demand growth as we move towards the latter part of this year, especially against a global backdrop that's quite weak. That's going to help ease some of the supply pressures. You're also going to see some easing of supply itself. And then you have the Fed pressing very hard on the policy brakes with strong forward guidance that's going to tighten monetary policy and continue to do so, even if there is a slowdown in economic activity. Um, you have rate hikes and you have QT. All three factors will weigh on economic activity, will weigh on credit, and importantly, as we've seen, will weigh on financial conditions, which will have an effect on economic activity. So I do think that interest rate sensitive sectors will feel the hit from tighter financial conditions and from higher uh, cost of credit, but that won't happen overnight. That will take some time to see the actual cooling in spending and then the implied effect on inflation. Given that, and given the fact that what we're seeing in markets right now is p uh, people pricing in a growth scare, not just the Fed raising rates uh, more than they had previously expected, do you think that's premature, that we're not going to see the growth scare for longer than people are pricing in? Yeah, I think we have to, to be um, quite clear in terms of the global picture. We have a, a fragile global recovery. Um, we have the likes of China suffering from a property slump, as well as the zero COVID policy. We have Europe, uh, which is facing a double hit from the war in Ukraine and the higher energy prices likely susceptible to a recession. I think the U.S. is actually leading the pack still here with a fairly robust economy today. Fundamentals remain quite strong. We're still seeing people spending. We're going to see a hot summer in terms of travel. We're already seeing it in airports. Um, but there is going to be a cooling of economic activity as we move towards 2023. So I think the talk of a recession or a slowdown is not something for today. It's probably something that's likely to become more of a risk as we move closer to 2023. And the economy will be at stall speed, therefore more susceptible to external shocks. Well, and of course, in theory, that's a problem for airlines who have been raising the price of tickets for the likes of Disney, which, yeah, did really well on parks in the quarter they just reported because people are still going on vacation. But at what point does that exercise of discretionary spending stop being the case? You mentioned China there, though, Greg, and of course, there are some growth concerns that feed into that, but also inflationary ones and supply chain issues. How much is that going to show up in the PPI data, not just today, but as we move forward, so long as that remains the case? Well, I certainly think that what's happening around the world is affecting domestic inflationary conditions. Um, there's the upside effect from the fact that we have these supply disruptions around the world. Uh, the zero COVID policy in China is leading to uh, renewed disruptions in terms of production, in terms of manufacturing and assembly activity, which is affecting, of course, uh, the domestic economy in China, but also affecting the rest of Asia and the rest of the world via these disruptions in supply chains. Um, but in the end, what really matters is how strong demand is in the U.S. for U.S. Uh, inflation dynamics. We still have an inflation backdrop that is pro-cyclical. So whenever we see a cutback in spending, we're seeing lower inflation. We've seen it in used car prices as a good example. That should be the key driver of inflation going forward. Certainly an easing of supply chain conditions would help ease some of the inflationary pressures, um, but that's not likely to happen overnight again. That's likely to be a process that will take multiple months, multiple quarters before we start to see some easing pressures on that front. Greg, thank you, buddy. As always, Greg Decker there of EY Parthenon. Can we spend a little bit of time talking about the airlines? I'm so pleased you brought that up. Airfares, Lisa, up 18.6% on a monthly basis, not on a year-over-year -year basis, on a monthly basis. I think that covers the gas prices for them, the diesel prices that they're covering. I think that will just about and cover and it some. and then some. We talk about not only the airline tickets going up, but how about planes getting canceled, right? I mean, just the idea that if they don't have a completely full flight, then they will cancel flight and basically push people to another one. I mean, that's happening. You're getting the idea of shortages of staff. But yes, airline tickets seem to have no ceiling for how quickly they can raise them. And capacity still is pretty much at maximum based on what they're offering in terms of they're not building it out. They're exactly. not building out capacity. Can exactly. you think of another industry out there right now 
Kaylee, where prices are up this much and customer service is down just as much. <laughs> can you think of another industry? No. I can't. I don't think I can, John, and it really speaks to pandemic-related dynamics in that you do have so much pent-up demand for travel that people are willing to shell out. But at the same time, because of the pandemic, you also have a serious labor supply supply problem. And I don't think those two forces coming together simultaneously are as evident anywhere as they are in the airline space. I spoke to the CEO of an airline recently about this, Lisa, and he turned around to me and he said, but you haven't been flying with us and, and that's why. And I didn't want to embarrass him because I have. <laughs> so now you <laughs> they're, are. They're part of the problem. So I just haven't named them. But if you remember the conversation, it happened on air and you can work it out. Futures down we'll a half of one percent on the S and P on the Nasdaq. <laughs> We're down nine tenths of one percent from New York. This is Bloomberg. There's certainly a lot of moving pieces in the economic outlook. We have seen a lot of froth come out of the market. I think the market is more trying to find a level. These numbers obviously are too hot. The Federal Reserve has not been forceful enough in stating not just what their goal is, 2% inflation, but the means to achieve that goal. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. It is not getting better from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Bramitz and Katie Lines, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures down four-tenths of one percent on the S&P. Bramow on the Nasdaq, we're down three-quarters of one percent. So why is nobody buying this dip? Because we heard that people earlier in the year were looking for a better price point to come in. Is this a viable dip? No. It seems like people are waiting for another shoe to drop. What is that? What are they going to get that's going to give them conviction one way or another? The psychology has shifted in a massive way. The buy the dip mentality has been retired alongside the Fed put. I had a message from Steve Chevron of Federated yesterday. Equities were up off the back of the inflation report. Do you remember that? It lasted about five minutes. He just said, I do not have confidence in this. I do not trust this. I think that's representative of so many people who are looking at the moves. You see the Nasdaq down 27%. We've gone through the single names, these big tech stocks down by monster amounts, and they're still nervous. And that's when the psychology starts to shift the other way, and you're really gripped by what we're looking at now in the bond market, a growth scare. John, you've been saying this. We have seen a bubble burst, and that's your words, basically talking about some of the tech names, some of the uh, high flyers that have gotten absolutely eviscerated, down 70, 80, 90 percent, if you look at some of the pandemic darlings. We're not seeing a blowout when it comes to financial conditions melting down. How much are people waiting for something to break? And I keep going back to that, because when you get the likes of the dollar strengthening, strengthening this much, and you get bonds and stocks selling off in tandem, things happen. When things move this quickly, Things happen, John. Things break sometimes. Are you worried about financial stability, Bramo? What is it? I am, to be completely honest, and the crypto sphere is a bit of a taste of that. What happens when money market funds go to sell their assets of treasuries and find that they're worth a lot less and they have to redeem some of their, uh, their cash positions? What happens when some of these people look at their positions and start to sell? I mean, we hadn't seen mass selling. Are we starting to see it now? This is wealth destruction, Kaylee. On the way in through Manhattan today, speaking to my Uber driver who was talking about how down he was about what was happening with crypto, how much money he'd lost in the equity market, in crypto, how much more expensive expensive it was to drive the car. A lot of people are going through those issues in real time. Yeah, and these are people who had money to spend during the pandemic. They had stimulus checks in their pocket. They were putting them to work in the financial markets. And now a lot of people who have gotten into the market over the last, say, 14 months have now seen all of that gain just absolutely eviscerated at the same time that that fiscal impulse is waning. So what is the American consumer to do when you see that kind of wealth destruction? You are faced with higher prices on rent at the gas pump that's when you start to have a real conversation about demand destruction in this U.S. economy. We've spent and we're spending a lot of time talking about the landing strip for a soft landing. Lisa, we had the conversation repeatedly yesterday. How much narrower has that landing strip just got after the data of the last few weeks? A lot of people say it's incredibly narrow to the likes of almost impossible because the Fed has to act and they are acting in the face of what a lot of people see as slowing growth. And we're already seeing some of the demand destruction around the edges and retail sales that came in negative on a real basis. At what point does the Fed rethink they can't? Because this is not stagflation, but slowflation. This is something else that's really difficult for them. The Fed's got a problem. I think that's stating the obvious. Let's whip through the price action right now. Your equity market's shaping up as follows on the S&P. We're down 18, we're off a half of 1%. The Nasdaq down 9 tenths of 1% is nothing compared to what we've seen. But if you're hoping for a bounce, you don't get one this morning. The Nasdaq 100 down by 8 or 9 tenths of 1%. Yields come in 
by eight basis points. Lisa, I find this absolutely fascinating. From 320 down to 283.71 this week alone and down another eight basis points on the day. This bond market has changed. We are talking about a growth scare now and not just the Federal Reserve hiking rates more than people think that the market and the economy can handle. And the growth scare perhaps not translating yet into the forecasts for inflation, which still are uh, arising in terms of where we're going to end the year. Why are people not having the conviction to buy at a time when you are seeing fundamentals continue to be strong in a lot of the companies that are the stalwarts? And Gabriela Santos, global market strategist at JP Morgan Asset Strategy Management, is joining us now. Gabriela, what will give you the conviction to go in there and say, this is it, this is the washout, we can start to buy? Lisa, I think the issue is we have three things happening at the same time. There's this growth conundrum with investors trying to figure out which is the most likely path from here. Is it a soft landing? Is it a recession? Is it stagflation? But you add on to that a correction of the excesses that we've built up over the last four years and amplified by a third factor, which is very low liquidity in both equities and fixed income markets. So I think at the moment, we've seen a big correction in valuations. We've seen nearly a 20% contraction in the multiple with the S&P 500 now trading at average valuations. But you still have very low conviction from investors to really truly believe this is um, the end because you still have all of these uncertainties. So what do we need to see? I think you especially need a bigger conviction on that growth scenario front. So you do need to see peak uh, in uh, housing costs. You need to see peak sanctions uh, towards Russia to feel more comfortable about commodity prices. And you need to see peak lockdowns in China to feel more comfortable about the growth outlook there. Gabriella, you talked about liquidity concerns, the fact that there is such little liquidity. You talked about the froth in markets that's gotten beaten out uh, by the readjustment in valuations. Are you starting to worry about financial market conditions, about the functioning of the basic nuts and bolts of how things trade and sell? So in terms of financial conditions, we have definitely seen a tightening in those ultra loose conditions that we had at the beginning of the year. You now have the tightest financial conditions that we had since 2018, but still uh, pretty loose and, and just approaching neutral levels. So we're not quite concerned about tight financial conditions quite yet. In terms of the actual functioning of the markets, I think at the moment um, that is not a reason for concern uh, or a need for the Federal Reserve. Or, or other regulators to step in is just something that amplifies any of the moves that we see driven by the macro stories and something that causes more risk aversion and a hesitancy to step in from investors. Well, in your base case, is still the Fed being able to execute that soft landing on that very, very narrow landing strip that John and Lisa were just talking about. With each day that passes, how much risk grows around that idea? So I think you invest based on your base case, which for us is a soft landing, but you diversify the other routes just in case, the recession and stagflation scenarios. So in terms of the investing based on the soft landing, we, we would still advocate for having a small overweight to stocks, a small underweight to duration, a balance between growth and value. But you want to still be diversifying the other scenarios. So to diversify the recession scenario, it's a small underweight to duration versus a big one at the beginning of the year. It's overlaying a quality factor on top of any of the stocks that we're thinking about investing. And in terms of diversifying the stagflation scenario, it means bringing uh, the prime candidate for stagflation Europe down more to a neutral. It's focusing on commodity exporting regions like Canada. And it's focusing on diversifiers like real assets that do well when inflation is the concern. Well, while we're talking about regional diversification, you mentioned Europe and Canada there. Let's talk about China, which you mentioned at the beginning, investors kind of need to see something changed with COVID zero policy. But it's not just that. You also have a serious crisis in the property sector. Sunak defaulted today because it didn't make its payment on a dollar bond coupon after that grace period expired. How are you thinking about China right now and where you would find an entry point in that market in particular? So I think emerging markets in China are also dealing with this trifecta of issues that we mentioned. In China, you had a correction of the excesses that already happened last year. That was a market that February 2021 was one standard deviation expensive. Now it's nearly 
one standard deviation cheap. You also have a growth scare happening at the same time, driven by some of those structural uh, slowdowns in the economy, namely property and low-end manufacturing, as well as the pandemic. So I think for investors, the correction of the valuation excesses is already there in China. Now you need to get a bit more comfortable on the growth picture. And for that, really, I'm looking for three things. The first is a redefinition of success when it comes to COVID zero. So it doesn't mean abandoning the policy, which is very tough to do. It's just redefining success, lowering the threshold for reopening. We also want to see that the policy put is still in place in China. So we want to see a little bit more monetary stimulus, maybe a cut in the loan prime rate this month. And lastly, we want to just see silence and regulations for investors <laughs> <Stop> talking <laughs> to get a bit more comfortable that we're past the worst. And there's an important innovation meeting next week, and it would be just welcome news to not see anything new come out of that. Gabriela Santos of JP Morgan Asset Management, thank you so much. Just silence, John. I'm sure that we could use that line occasionally. When are we going to resolve <laughs> these you know, issues? I, yeah. I know it's true. And, can and, TK stay out a little bit longer? Is that what you were asking for? No, That's the issue saying. I'm looking to resolve here. <laughs> Is that the issue? It's just, just silence. We just want silence. I'll so, take some silence. Do, do you hear it today? It's silence. just great, isn't it's it? It's just, you know, we're Beautiful. just talking. You can just take Substance. a beat. No one's going to fill it in with anything. <laughs> well, I do think, just going back to what Gabriella was talking sure. about with investing in China and investing in some of these areas. Remember when we were talking about how there was no yield anywhere and how uh, high yield was no longer high yield with average 4% yields? You can get an average 22% yield on Chinese high yield bonds right now. That's how high they have climbed. And nobody wants to touch this stuff. Unfortunately, financial markets don't operate like Main Street when things go on sale. <laughs> when things go on sale, people run the other way. Yes. And on Main Street, you know what happens. People go into the store and they buy. On Wall Street, they worry that things are going to get worse because you've got a loss of confidence. You've got the psychological shift away from buy the dip. A lot of things have changed in the last couple of months, and a lot of it goes back to the Federal Reserve. That Fed puts retired. And we've got guest after guest coming on today, despite the tightening of financial conditions we've seen that say... They're not ready to step back anytime soon. This is going to be the story through the summer. A lot of people saw Chairman Powell last week and thought him clarifying rate hikes through the rest of this summer was somewhat dovish. And now, given the data we're seeing, given the worries about growth too, it's starting to sound more and more hawkish, doesn't it? Because we're having this tightening of financial conditions. We've got a Fed committed to going further to bring down inflation. And no real sign of that story breaking just yet. And frankly, it's not just that. If it were just that, maybe we could actually move through it. But it's also an actual slowdown in China, in Europe, in other areas. Futures right now down a half of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100, down by one full percentage point. You might have noticed Tom's not here. He'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> He's really excited about Arsenal Spurs. Oh, I'm sure he is. He wants to start drinking early, apparently. Tots. <laughs> The, the derby. I cannot believe, Katie, that we're calling this the tots. <laughs> I, I'm sitting just, in this chair. I, I had to do it. Just can't. Sima Shah is coming up very shortly from Principal Global Investors. Looking forward to that from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word news, I'm Laura Wright. It's been a day of big swings in the cryptocurrency market. Bitcoin had been as high as a little more than 28,000 and as low as $3,000 less. The collapse of the Terra USD stablecoin earlier this week triggered a flight from many popular digital tokens. Senate Democrats were blocked in an attempt to enshrine abortion rights in federal law. All Republicans and one Democrat, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, voted to keep a bill ensuring nationwide access to abortions from reaching the Senate floor. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said he wanted to put Republicans on record just as the Supreme Court is poised to overturn the landmark Roe v. Wade decision. It's been two months since negotiators left Vienna and expectations are fading that the Iran nuclear talks will resume. The US and Iran won't talk directly to each other, so they communicated with messages exchanged via the European coordinator. For now, European diplomats won't declare the deal dead. That would force the United Nations to reimpose sanctions and take even more Iranian oil off the market. Disney reported subscriber gains for its flagship streaming service that were better than expected. But the entertainment giant tempered its outlook for the rest of the fiscal year and the company says it will trim spending on movies and TV shows. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg.
signing season is here. A very good quarter against an incredibly choppy backdrop. The uncertainty is palpable. We are cautiously optimistic. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. JP Morgan spot on. Delta flying. Feet on fixed income trading, on equities trading. With exclusive expert analysis. It's a stunning statistic. The bank earnings not resonating with investors. What's the disconnect here? Are they bracing for the worst? Can the market still go higher? Bloomberg Television and Radio. The fastest numbers and analysis you trust. We are focused like a laser beam on inflation. And the president's made clear that he knows that is the top priority for working families uh, and therefore his top priority. Gene Sperling there, the senior advisor to the president and former National Economic Council director. Futures this morning down four tenths, off session lows on the Nasdaq, still lower by three quarters of one percent on the Nasdaq 100. Yields come in again by eight basis points, call it nine. We can run down to 283.53. The excuse tour. Some people have called it that, Lisa. Inflation. The president keeps talking about it. We had an address yesterday, an address the day before, going through a long list of things that attribute the blame to all of these things that we see, but ultimately also saying the Republicans don't have a plan. And the plan that they do have belongs to Senator Rick Scott. The problem that the Republicans have with that is that the Republicans themselves say it's not our plan. Mitch McConnell said it's not the Republican plan. Do we know what the plan is? <laughs> Honestly, I have not seen the Republican plan. How do you have a plan? This is the tricky issue that President Biden is facing, and frankly, both Democrats and Republicans face. How do you have a plan when you don't really have a good solution? There is no silver bullet to how to bring down inflation. And frankly, if you're going to get blamed, what do you do with that? Let's talk to a member of the Republican Party, Congressman French Hill, Republican from Arkansas. Congressman, let's start there. The president says you have a plan. Mr. McConnell said it's not the plan. What is the plan? Hey, Jonathan, uh, Lisa, it's great to be with you. Uh, you're right, Lisa, there's not a silver bullet here. This is the result of 10 years uh, more plus of suppressed interest rates that have led to increased asset values. And then by the Biden administration, failed policies. They doubled down on spending and increasing demand by adding $4 trillion to spending last year passed through the Congress on top of the four and a half trillion that we already uh, spend every year to run the government. And uh, the Federal Reserve was too lax and too late in beginning to shrink its balance sheet and raise rates. That's coupled with the supply chain issues that we have. And here again, the Biden administration has done nothing to unleash American energy or really ease the supply chain constraints on hiring workers, getting truck drivers back to work, easing the logistics burden. So the Republican plan is first, don't keep spending money like drunken sailors. Well, Two, encourage the Fed to do the work that it should do. And three, let's unleash the supply side and break down these supply chain barriers. Congressman, the Republican plan sounds a lot like the Biden plan from what you're saying, because they're not talking about spending more. They're actually talking about reducing the deficit. They are talking about investing in the supply chain. And they have talked about releasing oil and gas and trying to figure out ways to bring down costs. What's the distinguishing feature about what you're saying other than just pointing at different places for the blame game? Right. Well, thanks, Lisa. I mean, the, look, the Biden administration policies are the ones who've created this demand slide surge on top of low interest rates. It's the $4 trillion that he's added in spending in 2021 that was warned against by Larry Summers, Jason Furman, Steve Ratner, strong Democratic economists saying it would lead to too high demand in the face of supply constraint. On energy, it's all talk. He's doing nothing to unleash American energy and make it easier for companies to get the permitting, build the pipelines, get the permits for new LNG export facilities, and get our production back up to th over 13 million barrels a day. Congressman, if we could focus on the monetary policy aspect of what you mentioned, having the Fed do its job. In theory, if the Fed does tighten aggressively, it could lead to a higher unemployment rate. It could lead to a slowdown in growth, if not an outright recession, which is something the market in particular is concerned about. Would you be happy to see those things if it got inflation under control? Well, inflation is a thief. Inflation steals for hardworking families. It makes it very hard 
and also it hurts our seniors who are mostly on fixed income. This is a uh, result of bad fiscal policies by the Biden administration and keeping interest rates too low for too long at the Fed. So this is the anguish of central banking faced by Chairman Powell and his colleagues. They, they have a tough policy choice of tightening and potentially reducing a recession or uh, not tightening as much and p perhaps leading to stagflation or market volatility. It's a tough position to be in, but we should uh, begin to shrink the balance sheet and lower, uh, I mean, raise rates, and the Fed should try to do the best it can to achieve a soft landing, which I know is Chairman Powell's ultimate objective. Hey, Congressman, two points you've made in the last four or five minutes. I'll put some emphasis on them. That this administration made some policy mistakes with fiscal policy, and this Federal Reserve waited too long. Chairman Powell hasn't been confirmed by the Senate for another term yet. Do you think he deserves a second term? I do, uh, Jonathan. Let me tell you why. Jay Powell has the temperament, the knowledge, and the leadership skills to navigate the Fed through this process. And because he was there and I thought did an outstanding job during the pandemic's height in March of 2020, he knows that the Fed has the tools to do this. I want him to own this issue and help guide the Fed through this next phase that's so challenging. What do you think of this term ultra MAGA that the president's using at the moment, Congressman? What do you make of that? I, what I make of Joe Biden is that he campaigned on bringing the country together and he's done nothing but divide the country even more in the first year and a half of his presidency. He's constantly uh, saying the dog ate his homework on the exit in Afghanistan, inflation, crisis at the southwest border, and to try to build relationships with Republicans, he calls them names. So I don't think Joe Biden has been very effective in managing the U.S. government or building a coalition to get things done on a bipartisan basis. Congressman, great to get your perspective on things, as always. Fred great Hill, to be with you, John. Wonderful Thanks, to Lisa. catch up. Brilliant, as always. At least a difficult moment. To his point at the end there, this is the issue that some people have with this White House at the moment, that it's still divisive. It, I mean, look, right now, how much has politics gotten so divisive that a lot of the uh, discussion points have to be shrouded in blame game, honestly, all around. And I think that that has become uh, an incredibly polarized uh, political backdrop that you see on Twitter, that you see on Facebook. I mean, we could go into all of the reasoning. Sure. But, you know, how much is it this White House and how much is it playing into the political sphere in this nation right now? What is it about Chairman Powell? He seems to be bulletproof. <laughs> that a lot of people come on the show and say that, you, you know, problems, they didn't do this, they didn't do that. And then the congressman follows it up by saying, yeah, second term, <laughs> well, I trust the guy. Who do they replace him with? And frankly, who do they bring in who's not going to disrupt markets, have that learning curve that people talk about before they get their legs under them and stop saying stupid things? I mean, how much uh, is that really what they're trying to protect against? I'm not going to say what I think. Futures down Please about a quarter do. of one percent. On. We rebound. Oh, come We're off on. session lows. It's oh, fascinating stuff. Market action. The oh, NASDAQ yeah. 100 is negative six tenths of one percent. <laughs> and the bond market yields are a little bit lower on a 10 year by eight basis. Everybody points wants to, to know. 84, 25. He missed it just in such a monster, massive way. They just he did. missed it. Everybody agrees that he did. They but kept doing QE. They carried on doing QE. QT hasn't even started yet. Think how ridiculous that is. So you'd kick him out? This is Bloomberg. <laughs>to call this a correction anymore, isn't it? It feels like a bear market, looks like a bear market if you measure it. It's a bear market on the Nasdaq. You take some big names, the likes of Apple, they're almost there. Equity futures this morning down a third of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, down by eight tenths of 1%. The Nasdaq 100 down, what, 27% year to date? Brutal. Something's changing in the bond market, though. Yields aren't higher, bonds aren't lower. Treasuries are rallying again. Four straight sessions, yields lower by eight basis points now to 283.71, higher the week 320 backed away. High of the year, 285 on twos, backed away. That was last Wednesday. We're down another four or five basis points at 259.21. And it's not just stateside, it's Europe too. The Bund market rallying. Four straight sessions, yields lower. Came close to 120 on a 10-year Bund this week. Now back down to about 87 basis points and down 11 or 12 basis points on the session alone. I want to finish on foreign exchange. 103.88. The lows on December... 20th, 2016. Right now, 104.22. We are not far off. That currency pair, Lisa, down nine-tenths of 1%. That euro weakness is biting hard.
You said it really well uh, earlier. Basically, if they raise rates, if the ECB raises rates, it's euro weakness. If they don't do enough, it's also euro weakness. It's sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't there. And that's been, uh, honestly, the common narrative for a while. A lose lose. Right. Sometimes that's when narratives start to shift the other way, but I'm not sure I want to be the person that tries to call that. I won't go there. The ECB next month, Lisa, I think they've got one of the hardest decisions going as a central bank because the downside risk to growth is right now. It's materialising. It's not maybe in the future. It's happening at the moment. The inflation rate is too high. What on earth do they do? Especially because this is inflation that's all the wrong kind. In the U.S., we look at the wage inflation. We look at rent inflation. It's coming from services. People are able to charge more. Not the same in Europe, where it's very much energy, very much imports, and the fact that the euro, euro has depreciated to the degree that it has. Who would you rather be, President Lagarde or Chairman Powell? I think I'd rather be Chairman Powell, to would be you? honest. Yeah, because I've got a second term. French Tail told me that I would. Well, there you go. <laughs> if he gets confirmed, we think that's going to happen today. But that was a very good answer. Thanks. Let's just cross that at price action. Let's get you some single names, some movies, and say good morning to Remain. Good morning, Remain. Hey, good morning, John. Well, you talk about bear market. We've been in bear market territory on an individual basis and an aggregate basis now, roughly for some time now. And you take a look at some of the uh, price action that we're seeing uh, in the pre-market here. Uh, that's going to continue. I thought it was interesting. Yesterday, you had the NASDAQ composite. Now, not only is it down just about 30 percent from that all time high, a 30 percent drawdown. But if these uh, declines that we're seeing in the pre-market now hold through the close, it's actually going to exceed the drawdown that we saw back in March of 2020. And a big part of that reason is, well, all the major members of that index, they've been in bear market territory for quite some time. One of the outliers was actually Apple. Apple shares had been down about 19 percent from its all time high as of yesterday's close. If the one percent decline that we're seeing here in the pre-market holds uh, through the day, then that would put now Apple down about 20 percent joining the likes of Amazon, Tesla, uh, Microsoft uh, and a couple other names uh, that I'm forgetting here. That's the flip side here with the I guess what you would call sort of the more stable companies, the companies with real gap earnings, real growth, and more importantly, uh, actually real uh, margin uh, ability to uh, grow their margins here. The flip side of that, of course, John, are the names that, of course, didn't have that. You have Zoom, which is down 80, 90 percent here, getting a downgrade today over at Piper Sandler. Those shares moving lower. And Beyond Meat came out with their for, uh, fiscal first quarter earnings, and they weren't good at all. The bloom definitely coming off the rose. Those shares down more than 20 percent. Disney has been struggling. Those shares kind of been up, and then they were down. Overall, the numbers weren't bad, but some of the guidance that Bob Chapek gave on the conference call uh, not really encouraging here, a sign that maybe there'll be a little bit of a slowdown in growth, particularly in that streaming business, and some concern about a year from now what that parks business is going to look like, some concern about a pull forward. One of the reasons why you're seeing a big bump here in the most recent quarter, that may not hold going forward. And then there's the EV space. Interesting note out by the folks at Wells Fargo downgrading Ford and GM because of the added costs uh, to their EV vehicles. They actually had some interesting estimates. They said that higher raw material costs are adding about $13,000 to the price of Chevy, uh, the Chevy Silverado EV uh, that they're making, and that for Ford, uh, the Mach-E uh, and their Lightning vehicle that they're making, about five dollars to $8,000 in added costs uh, just from raw material costs alone. Whether that gets passed on to the consumer, whether Ford eats it, that's a big question. And then Rivian, of course, which is trying to stay the course uh, with its uh, push into the EV space, says it's still going to meet its production targets for the year. Those shares, believe it or not, higher by about 4%. I remain a point you've made repeatedly yeah. on the close. If you don't have any earnings, there's no E to make up yeah. the PE. Yeah. You've got a problem right now, haven't you? Yeah. Big, uh, big problem right now, and you're seeing that reflected in the sell-off that we're seeing. In a massive yeah. way. Remain looking forward mm -hmm. to the close a little bit later coming up later on on Bloomberg TV and a little slice of that on Bloomberg Radio too. Tesla down 30% year to date. Lucid down 63, call it 64. Rivian. Bramo Rivian down 80% year to date. Just sort of shocking talking about the bubble bursting and Ford actually sold some of those Rivian shares recently at a discount, which only spooks people more. And we're just seeing that play out. Joining us now, Christian Miller Glissman, Managing Director for Portfolio Strategy at Goldman Sachs. Christian, is this a bubble bursting? Listen, I think um, you definitely are dealing with a significant valuation reset here. There's no doubt about it. And to some extent, um, that, that was in the making. You remember we spoke about that a few months ago, um, and we wrote about that in our balanced bear research. Unfortunately, coming out of COVID, you had this constellation of both bonds and equities being incredibly expensive. And now you're entering in a, into a very challenging growth inflation mix. Uh, where I think inflation is sticky, growth is decelerating, and I think the market is now derating those valuations. And as you were saying, in particular in the markets where I guess the uncertainty on the growth 
and or the earnings is the highest. So long duration um, tech uh, more recently. Um, and before that, cyclicals versus defensives. I think they've also been derated materially. How far along in this derating, Christian, are we? Always tough to say because if you look at valuations compared to um, the average since the 90s, um, we're, we're moving below that average now. But we know we're not in the 90s anymore. I think we're dealing with much higher inflation, much higher inflation volatility, a very different uncertainty on monetary policy. And even the growth picture, I think, has certain uncertainties, um, which are maybe more tactical in nature with Russia, Ukraine and China. Um, but I think there's also some structural questions with regards to what's the next growth engine. So you could argue that the valuation derating um, um, could continue. But what I would say, though, is, and, and I think John mentioned that earlier, I think we start to see the, the peak a bit in, in the bond yields. And we, we, we also have seen tentative signs of the peak in inflation. And we might shift from a high and rising inflation regime to something where inflation maybe is starting to, to decline. So we that could start to, to stabilize things a bit. Hopefully uh, we didn't disrupt anything too much and anyone's calling from the compliance department to say, uh, no, please stop. I think stop. he cleared it perfectly. I asked, <laughs> is it a bubble? And he said it's a valuation re-rent rating. I okay. mean, that's, that's, that's how you do this diplomatically. All right, so that we didn't necessarily uh, get the DJ in charge to call and get a uh, complaint. I am wondering what the opportunities are that might be emerging if the de-rating has been uneven or perhaps heavy-handed. Do you see any opportunities or do you think that at this point, hiding out in treasuries, in duration, and in the dollar seems to be a better bet and just go with the flow. Listen, I think near term, we, we might easily be stuck a, a bit longer in a, in a fat and flat range, as, as we've been saying. The range is getting fatter and flatter, if you know what I mean. So the volatility definitely has been a bit larger. Positioning and sentiment is getting more bearish um, as we speak. And that creates a symmetry that creates opportunities. But you still need to find momentum. Like a, a good trade, a good investment thesis is always built on good asymmetry. Uh, kind of more upside than downside and, and, and good momentum. And I think right now you have to be very selective in picking those battles. I think we've been very focused on real assets um, and I think um, opportunities related to that. Um, I think clearly commodities um, are pretty high up in that range and commodity related assets. Infrastructure is a very interesting real asset because it doesn't do only well when inflation is high. It also does well when inflation is high and falling. Um, but I think clearly what we need to engage with in the next six to 12 months as we kind of look a bit forward is, is to really add risk um, and eventually add cyclical risk because that's where the market is getting the most bearish. So you can think about um, at some point a CapEx cycle um, driving selective opportunities. You can think about kind of even uh, places that are linked to, to the consumer discretionary spending, which are clearly um, a lot under pressure. Eventually, they will prov provide good asymmetries. Well, Christian, as you say these things and as John, Lisa and I have been talking about the brutal action we have seen in the market, someone writing into me on Twitter that the three of you make me want to crawl up in a ball, crawl up into a ball and cry this morning. And I'm sure there are a lot of people out sure, there who are I'll feeling that. that way. For those people who just want to pull their money out of the market and go into cash, what would you advise them about how much cash you want to hold now to redeploy when those opportunities you just were talking about present themselves? Yeah, I mean, this is a very tough thing to generalize because it depends on each individual investor, the circumstances, you know it, like the risk tolerance and, and, and these type of things. But I think we've been overweight cash um, since uh, the beginning of the year. And, and I think I'm not saying that um, there's not opportunities emerging for medium term investors, but I do feel a, a decent cash allocation still makes sense. I think to your point, um, I think bonds are starting to buffer a bit. So you could argue that if you're really worried about um, a recession, um, kind of starting to introduce duration risk via bonds back in the portfolio might make sense. But what we've been saying is that um, duration to some extent is not a buffer right now, it's a risk. So it really depends on, on what you own right now. If you own long duration assets, I think adding duration back in the portfolio probably um, doesn't make much sense. So I think a decent cash allocation makes sense. Real assets, um, kind of assets that, that can protect you from debasement. If you're a dollar, investment, uh, a dollar investor, that's been difficult because the dollar has been the key um, safe asset. But if you are a, a non-US investor, um, clearly the dollar still has uh, that characteristic that currently it's protecting um, and kind of purchasing power as the Fed is fighting inflation.
Christian, brilliant work as always, mate. Thanks for being on with us. Christian Muller-Glissman there of Goldman Sachs. Just in response to that tweet, if you're an equity market bull looking for therapy, Lisa's not going to provide it. That's, <laughs> this is not where you come. I'm good with feelings. We could talk the about your feelings. Therapy for equity market Honestly, bulls. I mean, it's okay. Just lean into it. Allow it to you happen. You want to talk about feelings? <laughs> if I were Tom, I'd start singing, but I'm not, so I'm not going please, to. Please don't remind us of yesterday. <laughs> Let's was... talk about the losses because they're brutal and they're real. Let's we're do down that. 27% on the NASDAQ 100. The NASDAQ composite year to date. On the SP 500, we're down by 17.4% year to date. Lisa, real losses. It's real losses, and we haven't seen the force selling yet. When do people actually start meaningfully readjusting in a way that we have not seen? Futures this morning down another 1% or so on the NASDAQ 100. On the SP 500, down by six tenths of 1%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word news, I'm Laura Wright. President Biden marked one million U.S. deaths from COVID by calling on Congress to maintain funding for testing and treatment. Lawmakers remain unable to agree on how to pay for the fight. Today, the U.S. opens its second summit aimed at quelling the spread of the coronavirus. It would be another jolt to the European security landscape. Finland and Sweden are inching closer to joining NATO. Finland's president and prime minister threw their weight behind an application and Sweden's government is likely to do so soon. The Nordic countries are seeking to deter aggression from Russia. Moscow warns there will be consequences if they join NATO. Russia's oil revenues are up 50% this year, despite trade restrictions following the invasion of Ukraine. According to the International Energy Agency, Russia earned roughly $20 billion each month this year from the combined sales of crude and products. Still, the IEA says that new sanctions could change that. The Pentagon is negotiating to buy a tank-busting drone that would be sent to Ukraine. California-based Aerovironment makes the switchable 600, which can fly more than 24 miles and linger over a target for more than 40 minutes. The Pentagon has already committed to send at least 700 smaller, shorter-range switchblades to Ukraine. Global News 24 hours a day on air and a Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg. We have seen a lot of froth come out of the market, and there there certainly was a lot of froth in the market. You know, I think about the retail call buying, uh, you know, on a lot of the meme stocks, on the high momentum names. A lot of that has gone away, but it's also not fully gone. But it's going. That was Amy Wu Silverman, the equity derivative strategist at RBC Capital Markets. Futures heading south, down six tenths of 1% on the SP and the NASDAQ 100, down by more than 1%. Yields heading south as well by nine basis points. You can round it down to 10. We're down to 282.45. This is the currency pair that we're all looking at right now. It's euro dollar breaking down by one full percentage point, just about holding on, Bramo, to 104. 104 07. Okay, so why the extra weakness today? I asked John this uh, in the break, and John said to me, it's the euro. And honestly, there is an element of damned if they do, damned if they don't. But we are getting headlines from the German finance minister about, uh, about Russia weaponizing gas and about how we, they are prepared for some sort of gas sanctions. And I do wonder, John, how much that's playing into the outlook for growth. The economy minister saying things are escalating, and I think it's definitely playing into what's happening right now. It's why Nomura think we can get down to parity in the next two months. If you look at the US versus Europe, Europe is more exposed to the story in Russia, Ukraine, more exposed to the story in China than the United States. And that's the channel that a lot of this stuff is playing out in. It's the FX channel. And I'm not even sure how much it's got to do with rates, Lisa, because as you point out, even if they hike next month, is that euro positive, euro negative? I know a ton of people that think that's negative for the currency. Or is it euro agnostic? I mean, honestly, this has moved away from the ECB's hands and they have to take actions so that they don't seem to be exacerbating the weakness. But honestly, at this point, what will that actually accomplish? I could keep talking and wait for 103, but it's not happening. So we'll move on. <laughs> 
futures <laughs> down three we quarters doing? of one percent on the S&P. You didn't know, but that's what we were doing. Ah. Critty Cupta joins us now with a chart of the day. Morning, Critty. Yeah, good morning, John. You, the selling really continues, but let's put this into some context here because on the surface, it does feel like there is a lot of pain in the market. But if you compare this to the historical trend you've seen since 2009, which brings me to my chart of the day, by the way, and put on some standard deviations. It's a pity Tom Keen isn't here to see this. He would be so proud. You are actually seeing this drop only a one standard deviation move from the historical trend. So if you're looking at the technicals here, which, by the way, on an intraday basis has driven a lot of the trading, it's actually not that bad. But before I get yelled at on Twitter, this is important to, to keep in mind because how often has the market dropped below uh, one, more than one standard deviation? The answer is not much in the last couple of years, which kind of it means there's a little bit of panic here for the bears and a little bit of positivity for the bulls, if you will, John. Pretty thank you. Perfect timing. 103.95. <laughs> there it is. It was planned. There it is. It's pretty brutal. And if you want some levels here, 103.88, back end of December 2016. So with the lowest since then. Not pretty, Lisa. Not pretty at all. And what's going to be the reprieve here if there is not any clear-cut shot? I mean, they're already talking about fiscal stimulus. They're going to keep talking about it at the G7 meetings coming up. How much can they get ahead of this or how much do they just have to ride it out? We've got to talk about some earnings as well. So let's do that right now with Geetha Raghunathan, the Bloomberg Intelligence Senior U.S. Media Analyst. Geetha, Disney, the Walt Disney Company, talk to me about the numbers, the way this market has reacted to them, and your thoughts about the future for this company. Yeah, so good morning, John. So the numbers were actually very, very good, in my opinion. So the two key metrics that we were looking for, one was the Disney Plus subscriber growth. We were expecting about four, four and a half million subscriber ads. They came in almost nearly double with eight million. So again, a huge success there. Then the other metric that we were looking for was really the park number. And again, they outperformed there. Uh, and really, it's just been this huge pent up demand at the U.S. parks that has led to this fantastic outperformance. We saw them with operating margins that were 300 basis points above peak performance in 2019. So they are way ahead of where they were uh, pre-pandemic levels. The parks have made more than a full recovery. But I think where we're kind of really seeing, uh, you know, this nervousness is investors have gotten so skittish about this whole streaming story. And, you know, just like Lisa was talking about, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't, right? So previously it was all about making this pivot to, 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 to streaming, to direct to consumer. If you were not making that pivot, you were punished. Now, mm -hmm. if you've made the pivot, you're getting punished as well. So it, it's really this very, very funny time. And of course, again, with the parts, there is this economic overhang. Again, investors worried whether they're going to be able to replicate the strong performance, yeah. you know, quarter in and quarter out. Yeah, well, I mean, prices at parks were already inflated even before inflation really took hold. So do there. It costs way more than it would at the grocery store. But on the streaming story in particular, the ads are coming. And that's not just true for Disney+. Plus. Netflix is looking at an ad-supported model as well. What realistically will that make? Will it make a substantial difference? I think it does. So it does two things for Disney, and they already have a lot of expertise in this field. Remember, they do have the gold standard in video advertising with their Hulu product. And what you see on the Hulu product is with that ad supported tier, even though they're charging you $7, you know, a, a, a discounted fee for the Hulu product with, with ads, they're also making $7 from advertisers. So it's actually, they're, uh, they're, they're more profitable with their advertising tier than they are without. And I think that's exactly what they're trying to replicate with the Disney Plus uh, service as well. So what it does is it not only boosts revenue and profitability, but it also obviously will reinvigorate subscriber growth, especially if you look across the world where people are very, very sensitive in, in developing economies to price points. Um, so I, I think it, it's, it's an overall good move that keeps both that su subscriber trajectory as well as the financial metrics really up and running. I'll moan about my Hulu pricing a little bit later. All in, <laughs> it's costing me a fortune, Geetha. Can you tell me what the hopes and dreams are for that platform? Yeah, so Hulu has really kind of been in this tough spot, John. You know, there's been kind of this custody battle going on between Disney and Comcast. Disney owns 66 percent. Comcast owns 33 percent. Disney does have an option to buy it out. Uh, but it's it's really one of those those assets. It's a U.S. only asset. So, they've you know, it's not really had much international presence. But having said that, they've really done a good job. I mean, I think just kind of given all the constraints, has it been able to, you know, attain full potential? I don't think so. But just kind of given all of the limitations, 
it, it's really done a fairly good job in terms of, you know, advertising. That's really kind of been the main thrust. They have really excelled there. But I, I do think that one of these platforms, whether it's a Disney or whether it's Comcast, one of these companies kind of needs to own it fully to kind of really take it to its, you know, full potential. Geetha, great work, as always. Geetha Raghunathan there of Bloomberg Intelligence. That stock is down 5% in early trading. Brahma, you've said it more than once. It's not about the earnings for Q1, the first quarter of this year. It's show me something that they can't tell you. Show me the future and tell me it's better than people think it is. And to the degree that they can tell you, it's not great. They're actually talking about waning demand. I mean, yes, they beat their subscriber number, but they talked about how there'd be a cooling off, how they'd be pulling back from investing in certain types of productions. How much is that really just what people are responding to, even though people are still going to theme parks and people are still uh, buying subscriptions? And as for Hulu, let's go there. Once you've started paying for all of these streaming things and then you've paid for broadband, we're basically back to the cable bundle, aren't we? This is your third we're, rail, huh? We're, we're back there. <laughs> we're just back there. Now, my third rail is on the weekend when you try and find the games. Right, and, you and can't you've got to go them. from Hulu to Paramount to Peacock. <laughs> okay. And you can't even find anything. If there were a bundling kind of service, sure. would you be happy to pay the same amount? For a bundle? For a bundle you that's mean, more streamlined? Would, would I just get cable back? <laughs> well, it would be a bundle. It wouldn't Do you know be why cable. I got rid of cable? It, bundle, it, it was never this. about saving money in the first place. I didn't like the wires. I didn't like the actual cable. That's just so like you. Get the TV that is out, such a thing. connecting to broadband and just keeping the living room tidy and clean and zen, oh, just yeah. like me. Oh, yeah. Futures down nine tenths <laughs> on the S&P on the NASDAQ 100. <laughs> the control what, what are you laughing, laughing for? <laughs> down 1.4. Tight monetary policy is what's going to be required to get inflation under control. It's pretty obvious now they really should have gotten the tightening process going last year. There may be some economic pain that we have to take in order to bring down inflation. It's not really just that volatility is now in a new regime. We're also in a new regime of momentum. In relative terms, there's still a, a U.S. outperformance story. And let's see how long that lasts. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. We go again from New York City. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide live on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Lisa Bramitz and Kelly Lyons. I'm Jonathan Farrow. We're taking a dive here again on the S&P. We're down 1%. Lisa on the Nasdaq 100, down by 1.7. Not a lot of conviction to come in here and buy. There's not a lot of conviction about much of anything. You've got growth concerns that are in the forefront, as you can see by some of the haven bids. But you also have the concerns about the Fed hiking too much. Not yet stagflation. People still talking about momentum in the U.S. economy. But for how long? The growth concerns in the bond market, Lisa, for you and I throughout the whole of this week, front and center. Very much so, because this is a shift. We had seen uh, bonds and stocks sell off, people talking about a hawkish Fed. Rate fears seem to have peaked out, and now we're heading into the next phase. What comes next? What's the consequence of a tighter financial policy with, uh, with inflationary pressures that really crimp consumer spending? And Candy Lines, briefly this morning, euro dollar with a 103 handle. Yeah, a really tough spot for the European Central Bank to be in, John, because on the one hand, you do have these inflationary pressures stemming from the energy crisis. In theory, that means you hike rates. Therefore, you could, in theory, get a stronger currency. But at the same time, those very same pressures are causing a real growth scare on the continent. So what's a central bank to do? And also, what's an FX trader to do in either scenario? If the ECB hikes, if it doesn't, do you want to buy the euro? What does the Fed do from here? Yeah. We've been going through the wealth destruction for the whole of this morning. What's been taking place in crypto, what's taking place in this equity market, how much you're paying for your energy bills, your mortgage costs. Some of these big names and the moves we've seen, Bramo, so far this year. I talked about Netflix down 72, Facebook down 44 percent, Amazon down 37. But Apple in the mix now, almost down 20 percent off the highs of this year. These are some big, big moves from some big, big companies. Especially because just months ago, people were talking about these being the haven trades. Look at how much cash they're generating. Look at how bulletproof your iPhone uh, purchases are. Look at how people are lining up to spend thousands of dollars regardless of what the pricing is. And now people don't care. This is a change in the concept of valuations. And this is even before we get balance sheet reduction, before we get liquidity withdrawn from an economy that has gotten used to, or some people would say drunk off of it over the past couple of uh, years. I only know one happy man right now it's tom triple leveraged all cash king <laughs> that seems to be year to date the only place 
Lisa De Hyde. And when we came into this year and people talked about maybe building up a cash position, the pushback you got was, why would you want to own cash when you have inflation north of 8%? For a lot of market participants, this is why. And especially if that cash is in dollars. I mean, if you're earning in euros and you're putting it in euros and then you're going to the U.S., maybe not so much. But yes, this is basically the, the real trade that has emerged as the only haven at a time when there's so much other volatility. And how much is that disruptive in its own right, given what that does to other financial markets outside the U.S.? If you are just tuning in, let's get you up to speed. Your equity market looks a little something like this on the S&P and on the Nasdaq, too. We're down 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down by one6 Six percent futures negative. The opening bell about one hour and twenty-seven minutes away. The change though in this bond market, it's not about equities down, yields up. Yields are lower too, by nine or ten basis points. The two eighty-two forty-five, which is why we keep going back to this three-step process that a lot of people think we're in. They think we're in step three, from inflation fear to rate response to growth scare. Are we in step three firmly, Lisa, given the, the price action we're seeing in bonds right now? I'm glad that you asked that because Christian Miller Glissman was talking about the volatility and how the intraday volatility is annoying. That was the word that he used, partly because we're flipping between rate concerns and growth concerns. It doesn't feel like we're quite to the growth concern place in the U.S. yet, at least not from an economic perspective. So does it stick? Do you get conviction that we've seen the high in yields? Or can you basically say, look, we're going to get another re-rating as people look out at how much growth there actually is under the surface in the U.S.? Seema Shah joins us now, chief strategist of Principal Global Investors. Seema, we've done a lot of damage, a lot of destruction. Some people might call it carnage in this equity market. What do you look for to know when to step back in, when to buy? Yeah, it's a good question. I think with regard, we, we need to see inflation peaking and, and coming down. We need several months of this just to kind of give us comfort that we are on, on, on the right path. I do actually think that growth is going to stabilise. You know, monetary policy, it works with the lag. So we're not really going to see that significant slowdown in growth for at least, you know, another six months to a year. So I think as you see growth stay relatively stable and inflation start to come down, you could see a stabilisation in equity markets. Is it another rally? I don't think so, but I think you could see a stabilization. So what do you do with that, Seema? Do you start buying some of those growth names, the big tech darlings? I think it's not about necessarily the, the kind of the big tech. It's really about quality. Um, you know, we know that growth is likely to slow down over the next two years. We're actually anticipating recession in early 2024. Uh, we know that financial conditions are tightening. So that's the time where, you know, you want stability of earnings, you want the big balance sheets, pricing power to deal with the inflation pressures. Um, and a lot of that points to quality rather than specifically about big tech. But of course, we have to say that, look, you know, valuations have uh, cheapened considerably. Mm. So as long as we've been able to pick out the right companies with those various characteristics, I think there could be a, a decent time to get back into that exposure. Well, and Seema, obviously, one of the factors that has weighed on those growth high multiple stocks in particular has been higher Treasury yields. And yet, as John and Lisa were just discussing, the bid has come back into the Treasury market, whereas the 10-year was at 312 last Friday. We're now back down at 282. If the peak is in for inflation, is the peak also in on yields? So I wouldn't say with that much confidence that we've already seen the peak. I think there's, there's a fair amount of volatility still in the market. But if we're looking out the next six months, you know, where is our forecast for year end? We do see Treasury yields a little bit lower, that kind of 2.6% level. And that's because we are expecting a slowdown in growth. And as soon as you start bringing recession into the equation, it's very difficult to see yields sustainably above 3% for a prolonged period. Seema, just to build this out a little bit more, if we bounce, where do you think the leadership comes from in equities? In equities, I think it will be quality. You know, I, I think that's where we have to be focused because... You have a bounce, but the growth issues with the Fed continuing to tighten, that is not going to go away. So we need to be picking out the companies very, very carefully. This is where selection uh, becomes increasingly important. And when you talk about selection, is the focus really on the United States still, even though you are getting such a re-rating, if you want to call that, or carnage, as uh, others would say, in Europe in particular? Yes, absolutely. You know, you know, we look at the U.S. and we are concerned about the U.S., but if you look further out, Europe, China, emerging markets, the concerns are even greater. Um, you know, we've, as you've been speaking on the program, Europe is just surrounded by issues. Wherever you look, they are very much challenged. For China, we think some of the weaknesses is likely to continue. And emerging markets has that food price inflation um, threat, which I think is going to become a bigger and bigger problem. So for us, yes, US is problematic, but it's the dominant area going forward.
What about the UK, Seema, where we saw actually a growth contraction in March, which was unexpected, and yet Bank of England and Dave Ramsden still saying we got to hike more to rein in inflation? Yeah, it's been interesting with the UK. Um, you know, we have been relatively negative, the UK, for several years now. But then we have to remember the UK, it's, it's a big dividend play, right? So it continues to see that interest. They are going to be facing growth problems. We already know that from the Bank of England, they're likely to see recession in 2023. And we do see continued rate hikes. But it's that dividend play, the valuation perspective, the UK does actually make it look somewhat attractive. Seema, awesome to get your opinion on things, your perspective. Thank you. Seema Shah there of Principal Global Investors. Reflecting what we've been talking about this morning, Lisa Cayley, Nouriel Rabini, just on the bond market and the equity market correlation. Nouriel, good friend of this program over the years usually tuning in, says the following. Correlation between bond and stock prices going back to negative after being recently positive. Thus, concerns about inflation hitting both stocks and bonds now give way to concerns, Lisa, about a recession. Which is what a lot of people are expecting. I mean, even Seema was saying she expects it in 2024. The issue is when? And how do you hide uh, it before that, right? I mean, if you expect it in 2024, do you still dance? Do you still look for, for example, consumer, uh, consumer discretionary companies? Because that's going to reassert itself because we still have time left in this cycle. I mean, there are so many questions. If you get the economic call right, as you've said before, John, it doesn't sure. mean you're going to get the market call right, too. Some of this also is quite self-fulfilling. I got a message this morning, and they were basically asking, what happened to all the commentary about that resilient, strong U.S. economy? And in many ways, the data hasn't changed that much. The problem is that markets are anticipatory. They look at the data in front of them, particularly inflation, think about how the Fed's going to respond to that. They look at the financial conditions tighten. And a lot of that exacerbates the things that the markets anticipate. And you know where I'm going with this. And that's what financial markets do. They can shape the events they anticipate. George Soros has talked about that for a long, long time. But let's be honest. We have seen the ramifications for, for example, 5% mortgage rates. We've seen sales slow down. Prices not yet. Without but the number of sales, the volume of sales slowing dramatically. All of these precursors to more of a downturn. And so we are seeing the groundwork being laid for a lot of the prognostication that's been out there. So it's not completely in a vacuum that people are just having faith that what they believe is going to come to fruition. At all. You're going through the data right now and you're thinking, can the consumer stand up to this? We've been told that household balance sheets are strong, but when you look at the numbers, utilities were up 13.7% from a year ago, the most since 2008, just going off the recent inflation data. 60% of categories have seen prices rise more than 5% over the past year. Heard a lot of banks talk about that. And when you think about where real wages are, real wages have been negative, Lisa, for a 13th straight month. You'd have to admit that to some extent, and we can debate to what degree that the consumer is going to be hit by that in a significant way. And already has. I mean, remember the retail sales print that came in negatively on a, on a, in a real basis? You are hearing it around the edges. You're even hearing a little bit of concern about companies maybe not hiring as many people because they're just too expensive. So if we have a crisis right now in the market, it's a crisis of confidence. At some point, you've discounted everything we're talking about, all the glue. When is that point? That's the difficult bit of this whole piece. Futures are negative eight tenths of 1% on the S&P. The Nasdaq is down by 1.4%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the First Word News, I'm Laura Wright. It's been a day of big swings in the cryptocurrency market. Bitcoin had been as high as a little more than 28,000 and as low as $3,000 less than that. The collapse of the Terra USD stablecoin earlier this week triggered a flight from many popular digital tokens. Senate Democrats were blocked in an attempt to enshrine abortion rights in federal law. All Republicans and one Democrat, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, voted to keep a bill ensuring nationwide access to abortions from reaching the Senate floor. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said he wanted to put Republicans on record just as the Supreme Court is poised to overturn the landmark Roe v. Wade decision. Bloomberg has learned that HSBC began an internal analysis to help rebuff a proposal to split off its Asian operations. That proposal comes from the bank's largest shareholder, Ping An Insurance, which wants to improve returns. About 65% of HSBC's pre-tax profits last year came from Asia. The bank argues that much of that business is actually with Western clients that gets booked in the region. 
The sell-off in tech stocks has spread from more speculative shares to the world's biggest companies. Apple is poised to open today more than 20% below its January peak. Through Wednesday's close, Apple erased about $600 billion in market value since its record. That slump has led Saudi Aramco to surpass Apple as the world's most valuable company. Global news 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg. season is here. A very good quarter against an incredibly choppy backdrop. The uncertainty is palpable. We are cautiously optimistic. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. JP Morgan spot on. Delta flying. Feet on fixed income trading, on equities trading. With exclusive expert analysis. It's a stunning statistic. The bank earnings not resonating with investors. What's the disconnect here? Are they bracing for the worst? Can the market still go higher? Bloomberg Television and Radio. The fastest numbers and analysis you trust. Jay Powell has the temperament, the knowledge, and the leadership skills to navigate the Fed through this process. And because he was there and I thought did an outstanding job during the pandemic's height in March of 2020, he knows that the Fed has the tools to do this. I want him to own this issue and help guide the Fed through this next phase that's so challenging. The Jay Bulletproof Powell, the Congressman French Hill of Arkansas. At least the Democrats nominate him for a second term and Republicans still love the guy. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Well, to be honest, who else would fill that role and be able to smoothly transition? And not just that, but also it wasn't just the Federal Reserve. A lot of economists got inflation wrong as well. There were warnings, but there was a very two-sided and heated debate about inflation. I'm just raising the other side because I, I, I know he went hard on the uh, idea of he made a huge mistake, which they are. They're behind the curve. I remember all those economists saying, keep QE at $120 billion as inflation exactly. climbs through. Five, six, seven, I don't remember that at all. Futures <laughs> on the S&P down 8 tenths of 1% hey, on you the NASDAQ. Move on, not down let me 1. respond. 3%. <laughs> you weren't paying attention anyway. Yields down 8 basis points on a 10-year, 284.25. Greg Valier is with us now, Chief U.S. Policy Strategist at AGF Investments. Hey, Greg, it's amazing to me that we haven't heard much from Senator Mitch McConnell. What's the strategy here from Republican leadership as the White House tries to define the party by the views of the junior senator from Florida. Well, let me just make this point, John. Good morning. I think that Mitch McConnell, to use a sports analogy, is content to run out the clock. He's got six months to go. That's a long way. I think the Republicans don't want to talk details about abortion. They don't want to talk details about legislation. And they certainly don't like this uh, Senator Rick Scott of Florida saying maybe we need to have more people paying taxes. That goes against orthodoxy in the Republican Party. And then Scott says, well, maybe a lot of these key issues should be sunsetted every five years. So we should re-debate Social Security, Medicare, things like that. That has a lot of Republicans upset because the dictate from uh, Mitch McConnell is to just say nothing to try to get through six months without rocking the boat. Greg, that's fine if everybody else says nothing. If you leave a vacuum open and then the White House starts to define you by the plan of the only guy talking, which is Senator Rick Scott, then haven't you got a problem? Doesn't McConnell have a problem now that he has to actually step up and offer a plan? Or do you think that, not ma that doesn't matter going into the midterms? I think they'll be vague, John. I think they'll be very hazy. The great wild card here, of course, is Joe Biden's health. And Scott is not exactly subtle. He said in the last few days that Biden has mental issues, acuity issues, and that he should resign. Uh, I'm not a doctor. I don't know. I've seen Biden at press conferences where he stutters a little, but he stuttered for 80 years. That he's always had a stutter. So I, I, I think if Scott wants to go into that issue, that's going to upset a lot of centrist voters. I think McConnell would like to leave that one alone. Greg, the blame game is really popular in Washington on both sides. I mean, yeah. you're hearing basically Republicans coming out and explaining all the things that the Democrats have done wrong, and the Democrats are blaming Vladimir Putin, they're blaming the Republicans, they're blaming everyone uh, for the inflation that we're seeing. Does the blame game resonate with American voters? 
I think it does, Lisa. It's a good question. First of all, when you look at inflation, most Americans blame spending. You know, we spent a little over five trillion dollars last year, and an awful lot of voters think that that exacerbated or jump-started uh, inflation, and they blame Biden for doing that. Then we see yesterday an astonishing. I'd say error from a public relations standpoint with the White House has gasoline prices hit an all time high, announcing we're not going to do this big Alaskan uh, oil drilling uh, to to announce no Alaskan oil drilling on a day when gasoline prices are spiking to me is tone deaf. So there is some blame to go around. And I think as a result, you're going to see more support for drilling and exploration, and you're not going to see much more support for big new spending. Well, and Greg, of course, inflation is felt universally among the American population, no matter what party affiliation, where you are on the political spectrum. But as we look at that spectrum, how many people are already decided on how they're going to vote in November? How much can actually change in the next six months? Well, if, believe it or not, here we are in mid-May. I would argue that within a couple of months, attitudes will harden. And it's going to be awfully hard, Kelly, to have uh, Biden have a, a different perception when it comes up to inflation. I think he's stuck with it. There are things he can do. I don't rule out student loan relief. I don't rule out more aid to Ukraine with the Ukrainians maybe doing better against the Russians. But when it comes to inflation, this all important issue, I think Biden only has a couple of months left or the attitudes become locked in cement. One thing they were worried about, Greg, was energizing the base. Quite clearly, the abortion issues of the last couple of weeks around the Supreme Court has energized the base. Do you think that's done so sufficiently? A huge issue. There was a, a show vote yesterday in the Senate, John, that, as you know, didn't really go anywhere. But yes, I think this will, will be a big, big X factor. Still another issue where Mitch McConnell would like to run out the clock. The Republicans don't want to get into details. They would like to pretty much avoid the issue. Greg, wonderful to catch up with you, buddy, as always. Greg Van Dier of yeah. AGF Investments. Just how sustainable is that position from Senator McConnell, Lisa, just to wait it out? Wait until November. Honestly, if the blame game actually works, pretty sustainable because they've got a lot of blame that they can cast given the anger that people have about the inflation. Uh, so it, I'm, honestly, how do they basically just ride that and not have to provide anything substantive on the other side because nuance doesn't really sell? And we've brought this politics. up a few times, haven't we? Whether the calendar is on their side in the White House, can things get better coming out of the summer? And it reminds me a lot of the conversation we had last year, waiting for the supply side response for inflation to come down. It did not happen. And here we are again. City just published. They say the lack of deceleration in monthly core inflation increases the risk that Fed officials will continue to hike in 50 basis point increments through the second half of the year. That's a risk, not a base case. Jackson Hole in August and the September FOMC may see Fed officials guiding towards both the higher neutral rate and the need to overshoot it. The second half, Lisa, the back end of Q3 into Q4 in play. And to your point, that does means that timing is not necessarily on the Democrat side in terms of year-over-year -year comps because those supply side uh, uh, issues are not abating. I mean, in about five minutes, we're going to get the PPI reading. We're going to get producer prices and how quickly inflation is rising there. It is expected to come down. But do we get a new sense of how much momentum there is, frankly, in edifying the Citigroup view? Mike McKee is in the seat. He's just logged into the Bloomberg terminal. He's in the studio. We'll get to him in about five minutes' time when we get that economic data. I'll whip through the price action for you, down nine tenths of one percent on the S&P. If you're more constructive, call it down eight tenths, but whatever. It's been brutal. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down by 1.4 percent. Yields are lower by nine basis points to 283.35. Yields lower for a fourth straight session. So in a few minutes' time, we get a sprinkle of economic data, a breakdown from Mike McKee and reaction from Steve Rusciuto of Mizuo, the chief U.S. economist. For our audience worldwide, alongside Katie Lines and Lisa Abramovitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Heard on radio, seen on TV, this is Bloomberg. The economic data 10 seconds away, live from New York City on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Your market is lower again by 9 tenths of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100 down by 1.5. Yields are lower by 9 basis points to 283.35. With your economic data, here's Mike McKee.
Good morning, John. Well, on the inflation front, it looks like we're coming in a little better than anticipated on the core side. PPI for final demand on a month-over-month -month basis up half a percent. That is down from 1.4 percent in March, and it matches the survey. The core rate comes in up four-tenths during the month, down from 1 percent in March and less than the seven-tenths forecast for the month. Uh, a year-over-year -year basis, PPI is at 11 percent. That's down from 11.2%, and the core comes in at 8.8%, down from 9.2%. That's a little less than the 8.9% that was anticipated. Uh, the rise, primary, the, the increase in the month, uh, primarily attributable to a 1.3% advance in prices for final demand goods. So services are down, it appears, a little bit. I haven't quite got to that number yet. Uh, final demand construction up 4%. So uh, maybe a last gasp by builders trying to get things done. Initial jobless claims come in stronger than anticipated. Up, uh, They are up by 203,000. Uh, that's uh, 1,000 more than the 202,000 last month, but the forecast had been for 193. Now, we're at levels that really none of that matters. It's uh, rounding errors. It's uh, It could be... Um, some sort of uh, unique situations in any one particular state. It does tell you basically that the uh, overall job market is still very strong. Michael, just whip through the price action. I'll come back to you in just a moment as you get a few more seconds to go over this. We're still down. In fact, we're lower on the S&P by about 1.4%. Call it 9 tenths of 1%. The Nasdaq 100 down by 1.6. No major moves off the back of this in the bond market. We were already lower by 8, 9, 10 basis points. About that level now, 282.63. Crude lower by 1%. 1.4 percent. We've seen commodities get rattled a little bit more recently. Earlier on this morning, euro dollar with a 103 handle. Right now, 104.24, negative eight nine tenths of one percent on that currency pair. We're gripped by a growth scare off the back of some of these inflation numbers and how the Fed's set to respond to it and what all this means for growth further down the road. Mike, can you help us understand the relationship between the PPI numbers, the prices at the factory gate that you just went through? and the end consumer prices, just the relationship for you and what this could mean in the next few months? Well, there's not a direct relationship because what ends up happening, the, the PPI measures what companies are charging for their goods, their prices, and it's divided into those who sell directly to uh, people and those who sell to other businesses. Uh, and the uh, problem is, is that a lot of the price increases can get absorbed by other intermediate users in their margins. So it doesn't translate directly into CPI, but the fact that we're seeing a bit of a slowdown in the increases is is good news. Uh, well, it's, uh, it, it is sort of what we expected to happen on a year-over-year -year basis probably has to do with the, the base effects we've talked about. But the fact that the core comes in a little bit lower on a month-over-month -month basis is uh, a hopeful sign. Not, you know, don't Mike, read too much into one month. I'm glad that you talked about core. Does core matter as much with producer price inflation as it does with consumer price inflation, considering the fact that energy and materials are a lot of the bases of a lot of the uh, factory products that are made? Yeah, I mean, you put your finger on it there, Lisa. The fact that uh, companies are charging less for some of the raw materials or raising prices less, shall we say, not charging less, uh, is uh, going to be uh, take, uh, take a little pressure off of uh, final demand and uh, final demand goods. So in that sense, uh, it is a little bit of an improvement. And again, I, I want to stress one month does not uh, make a trend, but it is what has been expected. So that is some good news this morning. Mike McKee, thank you, buddy. Awesome, as always. Joining us now, Steve Rusciuto, chief U.S. economist at Mizuho, America. Steve, is there light at the end of this dark tunnel? Well, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Unfortunately, I think we're in the final stage of what is going to be a significant bear market, especially in equities. Uh, as we've started to disengage stocks and bonds yesterday, and it looks like again this morning, uh, I think that's recognition of the fact that what's taking place in terms of the equity market now is a rationalization or a recognition of the fact that the Federal Reserve is not going to be executing the Greenspan put anytime. And as a result of not doing that, the equity market it has to begin taking down earnings expectations. So far, the decline in equities has been concentrated in the multiple as long-term interest rates go up, the multiple comes down, stock indices come down. Now we're at the phase, uh, I believe, where we're starting to see bonds go down and equities still go down at the same time. Bonds go down in yield and equities uh, go down in price. 
Uh, I think that's telling us that we're starting to get to the point where people begin to start to downgrade their earnings numbers. And that's the final shoe that needed to fall in the equity market. We still could get down to that 3,500 um, on the S&P 500, and we could still wind up with slightly wider spreads. But if this trend continues with the two markets disengaged, i.e. bond yields can go down while equity uh, prices go down. We've really reached the top in the uh, uh, the yield on the 10-year note. Maybe 334, 324 was, would have been the absolute top. 305 uh, is where we hit, I believe, at the top uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I think we could very well be at the point where we have a top in the interest rate environment. Yes. Okay. So there's a lot to unpack there. I want to just start with the, what you first started on, the idea of we're at the final stages of a significant bear market. I'm curious what kind of recession you see getting priced into markets and frankly, as the most plausible in the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, you've asked a great question there, uh, Lisa. I mean, I think when you when you look at what's taking place in the economy, I find a hard landing, which is a growth recession. I, I think the economy is going to be running well below trend. I can't discount or ignore the fact that we can have another quarter of negative GDP in here, unlikely to be back-to-back -back negative quarters of GDP. But we're going to have an economy running in that 1% or slightly lower growth environment over the next four quarters. The reason why we don't get a classical recession is there's no major inventory overhang. There's no overbuilding in any major hard asset category. Uh, there are no significant financial dislocations that we know about. Out. Um, and therefore, I think in that environment, the hard landing is a more realistic scenario than the outright recession. But an economy running uh, at you know sub one percent means Q4 over Q4 growth for this year is about 0.4 percent in contrast to five percent last year, and that takes down uh, should take down operating earnings to about five percent growth as opposed to 10 to 11 percent growth, as has been recently discounted by the marketplace. Steve, we don't get the sense that the Federal Reserve is particularly concerned at this point about growth. They're laser focused on inflation. Where do you think inflation will be able to get down to by the end of this year? And where is that going to leave the Fed? Well, again, when you when you think about what's happening, the base rate effects are going to come off. So I think we're going to lose about 3% there. It's everything else beyond the 3% decline in the year-over-year -year numbers from the peak that are going to matter for the Fed. Um, and I think, you know, I think in the reality of the situation is we're going to come down more quickly. I think we can lose about half of the gains uh, that we've seen in the operating numbers year-over-year. -year. So I believe somewhere between July and, let's say, September, we'll see sort of a pivot by the Federal Reserve away from aggressively hiking rates to, to developing a more shallow rate hike scenario that will probably continue over the balance of the expansion. When do you expect us to see the uh, actual tightening matter to the economy, start filtering out to whether it's the slowdown in housing that people are expecting or companies borrowing less money? Well, I think you're already seeing it, to be honest with you. I mean, you look at the headlines of the, the, the conversation by Meta, you look at what's happened to Uber, you look at what's happened to Lyft, you look at the conversation from Amazon that perhaps they may have overbuilt issues. You look at the inventory of some of the um, uh, retailers that we see and inventory is accumulating. And then you look within the, uh, you know, the, uh, the financial uh, component and you look at the people who lend to households in the middle income to lower income areas and they're starting to see already that the performance on their loan book is deteriorating. So I think you're beginning to see it already at the micro level. When do we get it in the macro statistics? I think that just takes about another month or so before we'll start to see Steve, it. Steve, thanks for breaking that down, buddy. As always, Steve yeah. Rashuda there from Zoo America. Steve with the less constructive view essentially lay, laying out there, Lisa, the hard landing that some people fear. Honestly, saying that it's just going to take a month to start seeing more of that kind of data. And then do we get a confirmation in what he also said, which is that we've seen a peak in yields and that people will continue to pile into longer term treasuries and basically not abandon the lower for longer type of inflation outlook once we get past this period. And do you think the Fed continues hiking at 50 basis points, given what's happening here, given what we're expecting to see in the data? If they don't, what happens then? Could it be even worse? I mean, what happens if they don't follow through? I would expect the long end of the Treasury curve to actually surge, right? Because people sure. would be concerned that they would lose control over the Fed, uh, over uh, inflation and over the narrative. And then all of a sudden you've got a credibility issue. So they kind of have to, at least over the next couple of meetings. I get, Kaylee, that markets have got to anticipate. I understand all of that. But to see this kind of price action at the index level, at the single name level for some of the mega caps in America, across the crypto complex, if we can call it that, after just 75 basis points of hikes, 
<laughs> and QT hasn't even started. I get that you need to get ahead of what the Fed's set to do. It's pretty brutal, though, isn't it? Considering how little has actually happened to this point. Yes, we've moved up 75 basis points. We're talking realistically about double that, 150 basis points over the next three meetings. So what happens to the market then? Or is this a market that already has gotten there? It raises a question of how much has already been priced in and whether or not full capitulation is going to come or whether something has already broken. I mean, you talk about crypto, a yeah. stable coin not trading at its peg one to one against the dollar. That looks like something broken to me. And that's a problem, I think it's fair to say. We're discounting this idea, Lisa, that we get to 253% on Fed funds. We're worried we have to go even further than that. What we've seen historically, though, with this Fed over the last 10 years is that every time they try and push forward with some kind of hiking cycle, like this one, perhaps, of course, this is different, they have to back away because financial conditions tighten so much they have no choice. So financial conditions have got way ahead of what the Fed has done already because we're anticipating they've got to do so much more. At some point, does the Fed put come out of retirement because it's gone too far? At some point, and even Jim Bullard kind of pointed to this, that it will come out of retirement, but you're not seeing the kind of disruption right now in credit markets that would lead to that kind of intervention. I think a lot of people point to that. You're not seeing it yet. 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 I mean, I've got no idea dun, when it dun, comes. Dun. Just not, yeah, and we've had so much Fed speak this week, and <laughs> they haven't gone there. Futures down six tenths on the S&P, on the Nasdaq down a little more than one percent. From New York, it is relentless. We'll get the viewers to Bajra Japra of Sokgen very shortly on Bloomberg TV, alongside Bob Dollar Crossmark and the view from Deutsche Bank. They are forecasting a recession. Deutsche Bank's call coming up shortly. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word news, I'm Laura Wright. President Biden marked one million U.S. deaths from COVID by calling on Congress to maintain funding for testing and treatment. Lawmakers remain unable to agree on how to pay for the fight. Today, the U.S. opens its second summit aimed at quelling the spread of the coronavirus. It would be another jolt to the European security landscape. Finland and Sweden are inching closer to joining NATO. Finland's president and prime minister threw their weight behind an application and Sweden's government is likely to do so soon. The Nordic countries are seeking to deter aggression from Russia. Moscow warns there will be consequences if they join NATO. Germany is accusing Russia of using its energy exports as a weapon. That's after Moscow reduced natural gas supplies in retaliation for Europe's penalties over the war in Ukraine. It appears to be a largely symbolic move, though. Germany's economy minister says the cut amounts to about 3% of the country's Russian gas imports. The UK and the European Union failed to resolve their differences over Northern Ireland's trading arrangements today. That could lead to a diplomatic crisis and a potential trade dispute. The UK says the current arrangements result in Northern Ireland being treated differently than mainland Great Britain and the UK may have to act on its own. Global news 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg. The Fed has its work cut out for it. Uh, it does need to slow aggregate demand. Um, and typically, you know, starting from behind the curve, the success rate isn't very high. They've missed the boat a, a bit here. I think it's pretty obvious now. They really should have gotten a tightening process going last year. Michael Darda, chief economist and macro strategist at MKM Partners with the oft thought about idea that the Fed should have probably started tightening sooner. It does look like another day of a carnage maybe not carnage to the same degree as yesterday, but the day is still young, very much headed in the same direction, at least, that we saw yesterday. S&P futures down seven-tenths of a percent. Near session lows, NASDAQ uh, down more than that, about 1.4 percent ahead of the open. The euro actually crossing the 104 line, hitting in the 103s earlier today, the lowest levels, the weakest levels, I should say, versus the dollar going back to 2016 before getting to that 104 level. We are seeing treasuries get a bid because there is this concern case about growth that we keep talking about, even as we get people who are going on vacation <laughs> and, and going out there and actually taking the prices that are being given to them. 
Yeah, there is so much pent up demand because everybody was stuck at home for so long that people are still way paying up to travel. And Lisa, I'm looking at that euro and a conversation seriously being had about the possibility of parity in the next couple of months. I'm like, huh, seems like it might be a good time to go to Europe. Except, I don't know if I can afford the plane ticket. Exactly. And that's where I wanted to go with this. I'm glad you brought that up because yesterday in the CPI print, 18.6 percent month over month price inflation in airline tickets. Why? Is it just because they can? Helene Becker, senior research analyst at Cowan, just got back from London and from a trip in Europe. You got to take advantage of the strong dollar and the weaker euro. Congratulations. Why? Why are airlines raising prices so quickly? Um, hi, Lisa. Yeah, they are really um, going up. We're thinking they'll go up something like 7% a month through at least June, maybe into July. But costs are going up. Labor costs have gone up quite a lot. We've talked about that. We've talked about higher fuel costs. Airport expenses have gone up. Um, and and it's, it's, it's not only the, the attracting employees, but it's also retaining employees. Remember, during the pandemic, um, a lot of airlines encouraged people to take leaves of absence, and they did. And then they found other jobs, and they decided maybe they like those other jobs better than, than the uncertainty of working for an airline, and they didn't come back. And as a result, you have all this, un you have to hire new people, right? We've talked about American hiring like 18,000 people, Delta hiring about half that many, JetBlue hiring something like four or 5,000. Um, and you have to pay up to attract, and then you because you've paid up, you have to raise everybody else's wage. You have huge wage inflation. And then jet fuel costs, they're yeah. 5 to $6 a gallon, which in, in uh, spot, the spot market, um, most people are paying 350 to 4 But still, we've never seen jet fuel costs that high. Well, and Helene, all of this makes sense. And then there are some people uh, who I have spoken with and, and some people who I even work with who say, you know, they are purposely keeping out supply. They are purposely not bringing planes in. They are not flying unless they have full capacity to make as much money as possible. And they're jacking up prices as much as they can because of how much demand there is. They're actually going to make quite a bit of profit. What do you say to that, Helene? Well, I hope they make a lot of profit. It's the industry has a tendency to not do that for a sustained period of time. But um, on the capacity front, so let's talk about that for a second. We're about 80% of where we were in 2019. Airlines retired a lot of aircraft. We've talked about that before. I think we identified something like 800 to 1,000 aircraft that were 18 years of age or older in 2020 that probably don't ever come back. Okay, so that's one issue. Put that in a bucket. And then in the next bucket, put the max issues and the delivery delays mm -hmm. and then put supply chain issues in the third bucket and look at the delivery delays on the A320 Neos, the A321s, um, it, look at the 787s that Boeing can't deliver. United thought they'd have the 777s back in service. Um, we thought they'd have them in service by July. They thought by March. They're not going to be in service at least until next year, um, again, because of supply chain issues. So it's not that. And then, then you have the issue of not having enough pilots and staff and all the issue we just talked about. So you have this huge issue of yeah. the demand side, which you correctly point out is 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 high. Kelly talked about it in the open. And then you look at the supply and you're right, it's constrained. But what is the industry supposed to do if regulators are making it difficult to get the equipment in and they can't get the people anyway? OK, so if supply is going to stay constrained, Helene, what about a correction on the demand side? Because I realistically am looking at summer vacation and thinking, <laughs> Maybe I should just drive to the beach. Maybe I shouldn't cough up all that money for a plane ticket. I mean, how much more pricing power can these exercise, airlines realistically exercise before demand destruction starts to kick in? Yeah, we're really worried about that for after Labor Day. So, so two things, Kelly, I would say that on the first one is you're absolutely right. The airlines will price themselves out of the market, but in the short term, it kind of eliminates some of the marginal traffic, but it is expensive. I was surprised at the fares we paid as well, but part of it was work, part of it was vacation. Um, but the other part of it, too, is the U.S. is the only country, I think, that's still testing from a pre-departure basis. So that mm -hmm. brings with it a lot of uncertainty. You, you go on your vacation and you have to hope you're asymptomatic or you're not asymptomatic. Rather, you test negative the day before you come home. Um, or you're stuck wherever you are for anywhere from three to seven days. So that brings with it a fair amount. I mean, travel is uncertain anyway. We've talked about 
that and cancellations and so on, that testing just adds another layer of, of concern um, that probably keeps people more local to your mm -hmm. point. And then, um, and then business travel, um, you know, it's, it's what, down 40-ish, 30, 40% from where it was pre-pandemic. So, so the numbers, we, we'd be over 3 million passengers a day right now if... Helene Becker, I don't know if we lost your connection. We think we have to leave it there. Helene Becker of Cowan, thank you so much uh, for being with us. It's a real issue. And I do wonder, Kaylee, how many people, to your point, are going to just stop flying quite as much just because yeah. the fares. I mean, honestly, I can say from a personal uh, standpoint, I've actually seen fares seen the prices and then decided not to go on a vacation because yeah. you're going to pay three times as much as you were going to pay. Yeah, you a year and me ago. both, Lisa. Absolutely. And and I know I come out of all, woe is me, I'm not going to go on vacation. I'm paying so much money for rent in New York City. But I also have a stable job. I make more than a living wage. You have to think about the American consumer that that isn't necessarily the case. And for necessities, for groceries, your energy bill, gas, to get in your car and get to work, you are faced with higher prices. At the same time, you're you're looking at your 401k if you have one in an equity market in which we have seen such massive wealth destruction and six trillion dollars wiped off the value of U.S. equities in not even two months. Where does that leave the consumer? Right. And this is a reason why Steve Rusciuto of Mizuho is saying that we're, we should start to see the effects of that, of that tightening in financial markets, as well as some of the price pressures that people are feeling in about a month. Well, coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio, Rose Gottmuller, uh, former NATO Deputy Secretary General, will be joining uh, as we deal with what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. Right now, in markets, a follow-on to yesterday's pain as we see the losses deepen, even with the correction moving solidly into bear market territory, certainly with the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ now uh, down 158, uh, down 1.3 percent. S&P down 27, 3902 as we head uh, toward the end of the year. And it is a bid into the Treasury market as people look for havens, as people worry about growth. This is Bloomberg.